Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Jeff Gerstmann Show. Today's program, we're going to talk about video games. With me, uh, your host for this week's show, my name is Jeff Gerstmann. Uh, I have... uh, I've been involved in uh, covering v- uh, video games, uh, I- interactive entertainment. If you're not familiar with, you know, uh, for uh, for about the past thirty years, for the, the past three decades, um, and um, and I'm here to share my expertise with all of you. Welcome to the program, uh, Fortnite. You heard of this thing? It's brand new. It just came out. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with it. I think the kids love it. There's Roblox. You, you, Ro, Roblox. <laughs> you know they got virtual reality headsets. What go on your face now? This yeah, is just crazy. It's just crazy. We've what I'm, we've come a long way uh, since the bleeps and bloops of Pac Man. I think we can all agree. The video games have come a long way since the ladder climbing and hammer swinging of Donkey Kong. We've come a long way from the cherry eating and apple dropping ways of Mr. Do. The bleeps and bloops of Mr. Do's Powerball bouncing around the dirt. We've come a long way since the noises of kicks. Not that far. I don't know. Sometimes I think video games need a little bit more. You know, we we just uh, we've lost our way. Come a long way from the of Cubert, you know. Um, <laughs> E3 is uh, officially gone. They have uh, they have packed it in on E3. That's this morning's news. Um, not a huge surprise, but still uh, made official. We'll, we'll get into all of that as well as the game awards, as well as all uh, how Fortnite is now um, a platform. If you were running a video game wiki, you would have to now ask yourself the question, do you add, is Fortnite a separate platform? The answer is actually no, but you at least have to have the conversation. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and lots, lots more. Why don't we get into? Let's just get the let's let's get into our ad here. Let's get it done so we can uh, we can get back. We can talk about video games for the next three ish hours or so. Uh, we'll be back in a moment. It's time for a miracle. It's time for a miracle made. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold. You need to check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. That means you're going to get better sleep every night. That silver infusion also prevents up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. That's right. You have to keep the sm- keep the smells at bay until you have time to to wash it. Less laundry means you know you're running fewer loads of laundry. That's saving money on a few different things: fabric softener, soaps, and such. Uh, it's just a, it's a, a some some add on effects on top of all that stuff. Um, you know none of this would matter if these sheets felt like you were scraping burlap sacks on your flesh you know you're in luck miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and they feel as nice if not nicer than sheets used by some five-star hotels they make the perfect holiday gift get in there it's the 12th today get your order in make it happen get get going on it that's the perfect gift for your spouse friends or family 
Who doesn't want better sleep and luxurious feeling bed sheets? And they come with three free towels. So it's like you're getting two gifts in one just in time for the holidays. You know, or, or you know, maybe you keep the towels for yourself. Hey, look, man, maybe you just get some, some free towels on the side. These are side towels. Nobody has to know. Nobody has to know about your side towels. Your secret side towel stash. Those are your three free towels. Or, you know, hey, give them as a gift. You can do that. Split them up. Give the towels to somebody and the sheets to somebody else. The options are literally endless. And you get to stop sleeping on bacteria. Bacteria can clog your pores and cause breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Let's get on board right now. Go to trymiracle.com slash Jeff to try it out today or gift it to someone special this holiday season. And here's a special deal for you. Save over 40% off. And if you use the promo code Jeff at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Man, Miracle is so confident in their product. It's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash Jeff and use the code Jeff to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash Jeff to treat yourself, a friend, or a loved one this holiday season. All right, and we are back. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I was gonna, uh, we were gonna talk about Fortnite, but I just, you know, since it, it did just kind of just happen, let's just, uh, let's just sound the. In today's news, um, that's it for E3. It's official. They put out a statement. They also uh, talked to the Washington Post for an article that ran simultaneously. Um, and of course, everyone's been been running their articles um, this morning. Uh, the ESA, which is the Entertainment Software Association, has decided to um, give it up, give a, to give up and give it up for E3. That's it. The 2019 will go down in history as the last one until they desperately try to bring it back. And like, like let's, you know, five years down the line, someone's going to have an idea and they're going to just go like, we could just call it E3 and they're going to try to do something called E3 again. I'm I'm convinced of it. it. It's they, they will, they will try to do something with it down the line. Um, but for now, that's it. The statement uh, given by Stanley Pierre Louis, the president and CEO, uh, given to uh, the Washington Post is after more than two decades of hosting an event that has served as a central showcase for the U.S. and global video game industry, uh, the Entertainment Software Association has decided to bring E3 to a close. Uh, We know the entire industry, players and creators alike, have a lot of passion for E3. We share that passion. We know it's difficult to say goodbye to such a beloved event, but it's the right thing to do given the new opportunities our industry has to reach fans and partners. Which, yeah, that's... um, I I think that about sums it up. At the end of the day, the the big problem with E3 was that that it was... um, a big expensive showcase in search of a purpose in a world that was increasingly online. The pandemic of course has accelerated aspects of that, but the show was already like, like don't, you know, there you will have people that will try to say like, well, the pandemic really ruined, but like this thing was headed off the rails already. E3 was, was, you know, after the 2019 show was, was kind of, desperate and weirdly empty uh with with you know companies like Sony pulling out. And it's not the first time, you know, companies would come and go. There was a period of time there where Activision pulled out of the show completely. Of course, EA was off had EA play their own event somewhere else. Even Microsoft was having fan events at their, you know, at the micro it's now the Peacock Theater, but at the over at the Microsoft Theater, they were having fan events that were larger than their booth presence on the show floor. And, you know, so you just, there were, 
there had been a lot of signs uh, for the last few years of that show that it was getting to be time to wrap it up. Um, and, and it's simply a factor of, of the internet being the internet. Uh, the show being very expensive for publishers and a lot of publishers just going like, what are we getting out of, you know, what, what is our ROI? What is the return on this investment we are making in this booth space? What are we getting out of it other than reaching the handful of people that can make it to this show? I mean, there's a lot of people here, but like the, our worldwide audience, when we do live streams, when the news reaches much more people than this, and we can do those out of our office for $0. Um, and so those are the big factors. Well, you know, the, the show, they, they tried to open it to the public, if you remember, there in 2019. And maybe, was it even 2018 or was 2019 the first year? But open to the public ruined a lot of aspects of the show. It made getting around, uh, you know, on the industry side of things, I'll say. Um, it made getting around a hassle because of the increased security and checkpoints and metal detectors and all of this other stuff that came with the 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 public getting access um the public getting access led to booth spaces having fewer games in them uh playstation booth in particular used to have a huge area full of indie games kiosks and kiosks full of indie games it was a great place to just see a lot of small games in one place and the year that the public was let in they just gutted that space and left it empty because they realized they would need places for people to stand um, and so they wanted to have it both ways. They, they wanted to have a public show, but they didn't do any of the things to make it amenable to the public while still serving whatever the industry's needs were. And so the show became less useful for the people who were paying tons and tons of money to, to have booths and, and go and all this other stuff while also not being an amazing experience for the people that were you know, paying like the public people who were paying for tickets to see the future of video games. And they're like, Oh, it looks like a, a seven hour line to play 20 minutes of this star Wars game. Wow. That's great. What a great time we're having. Um, and so it, you know, it just, it outlived its usefulness at the end of the day. Um, that's the, the, that's the thing like, you know, and, and if you've been following me during E3 time in years past, you know, that we've been talking about that for at least the last five years that E3 was a show, if not longer, that was a, a constant topic of people that were there that were like, this is, you know, and, and don't mistake that for, and, and a lot of people do want to be like, you shit on that show every year. It's like, no. The show's actually awesome. It's great that we get to do this. But also, every time you're walking around, you're like, this is dying. This isn't, there's there's nothing healthy about, the, like, this whole thing seems like it is not, like, aging well. It feels like it is not catching up with the times. It feels a little further behind Every year you go, you're like, I don't know who this is for anymore. Like, I'm still getting a lot out of it. But is the industry, it doesn't seem like it. Like, you know, especially, and I think there, there are a lot of conversations that kind of flow in and out of that sort of stuff. Where, obviously, the, the, the show was designed for a few different purposes, right? Originally, uh, one of the biggest purposes was for publishers to meet with retailers, in the middle of the year and say, here's what we have coming out in time for the holidays. We think you should buy a lot of copies of God of War to put in Toys R Us. Now there's, I mean, there isn't even a Toys R Us to put fucking God of Wars in. Uh, well, I guess the, the Toys R Us is slowly coming back or whatever. But like the retailer process has become a completely different thing. You know, people go to Minnesota or whatever when they need to meet with Walmart or, or you know wherever Best Buy is um, or do they even meet with retailers anymore because as digital sales become more and more of a thing how much time do they have to spend also you know like GameStop has their own managers conference and so that kind of replaces a lot of that stuff from E3 um, and so you have different pockets of the show that are that exist elsewhere now basically um, and a lot of that stuff gets kind of spread throughout the year and, 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 you know, happens in more opportune times. Um, 
so with that aspect of the industry changing, the retail aspect of E3 became a lot less useful. Um, investors and analysts certainly play a role there. The Michael Pactors of the world, and they they go to like the shadow E3 where they're seeing stuff that is even... As someone who started, uh, you know, like online, there, the shadow E3 used to be there's stuff behind closed doors that only people at print publications get to see because their E3 issue isn't going to hit until September or whatever. And so w w online people will know about it by September, but we don't need to know about it right now. And so, you know, there's a bunch of behind closed door stuff that they're only showing to print magazines. Then the print magazines went away. And so that kind of long lead stuff sort of disappeared um, and, and kind of, you know, analysts got to see little bits and pieces of that stuff as well, but that would exist in different forms as well. Um, and the press has been, you know, whatever this year has been brutal. I know wired laid off a bunch of people this morning. Um, <clears throat> but the media has been continually gutted over the last handful of years but also their usefulness or their, uh, the, our, our usefulness, our, uh, uh, role to be played in all of that process is a lot, you know, is, is, is that worth the money? Um, especially with, with everything else, you know, kind of going away because the websites of the world will write about this stuff, no matter where it happens, they don't necessarily need to go to E3 to see it just like they don't necessarily need to get the exclusive on a trailer. They'll still run the trailer anyway. We just saw that with GTA. Uh, you know, it's like, Oh, well, yeah, the, the rockstar channel is going to get a ton of views on that. And then 24 hours later, you'll start to see it show up on, you know, the IGN YouTube channel and all this other stuff so that they can pump their views up as well. Um, so the, the usefulness of the media and, or the, the, the role the media plays is, is a lot different. Um, and there's a lot less of it. And so do you adapt that to like, and they tried to adapt that to be like, we, we want to let creators come to the show. It's like, well, the people that are doing all the streaming and YouTube stuff, like everything I hear from them or everything I'd heard from them back around that time, whether it was E3 or PAX or anything, you heard a lot more about PAX. But, um, it was a situation where it was like, yeah, by me being here, I'm fucking up my actual schedule for all of my streams and videos. And it's actually costing me a lot of views, viewers, and, and like, it's messing up my schedule. So it'll be hard to get those people back because I'm here doing this. And so the, the value for those types of people was always really weird. Um, especially if they just like stream one game, you know, it was just like, you're a Fortnite streamer. It's like, what are you doing at E3? You know, you don't, you know, you probably don't need to be there. It's probably not your, in your best interest to be there anyway. Um, so whatever the things changed, you know, at the end of the day, the industry changed the, the way this, the ways that the industry reached the public, the media, whatever else. Um, all of that changed. And so you have an E3 that would very much need to adapt. And so they tried to sort of um, try to make those changes. They tried to adapt. They tried to find ways to, whether it was letting the public in or that, you know, they tried to have more activations. They tried to have a lot more like marketing and paid stuff on the show floor because you know, exhibitors were dropping out when, when a Sony says we don't need to be there anymore. We're going to focus on Paris games week. Uh, your show's done. When Nintendo says, you know, we've got our own videos and yeah, I think we can just do that. Your show is done. Uh, and so it's, it's been a, a pretty obvious thing here. Like I said, for the last handful of years of that show that like, this thing is flying off course. And I remember the, the year that I don't remember if this was 2019 or if this was before that, but I remember there was a year where GameSpot had some truck and it was out in the, in a public square area where people could, could go do it. And there was this sponsored truck 
and the number of like meetings I was in and I skip a lot of meetings. I skipped a lot of meetings, but the number of meetings that I was still in, there were just people obsessively talking about the truck. Like, yeah, we got a Jack in the Box sponsorship and we're going to have the new day there and they're going to throw Jack in the Box tacos out to people. I'm like, that's hilarious. But also, I don't think any of that, I'm not sure how much of that actually happened. Um, and they're like, we got games in the truck and, and kids can, you know, people can come in and they can go in the truck and they can play games. And we're, we're figuring out what games are going to be in the truck. We don't know what games are in the truck. We got to figure out the truck. The truck. Um, you know, E3 became more about things like that. We filmed some of it. There was like, you know, whatever, like weird Doritos football thing. I don't forget what the fuck it was, but there was like a whole outdoor area that was just like full of ads, full of like physical manifestations of advertisements or, you know, activations as they call them. Um, and you're just like, what the fuck is happening out here? What happened to E3? Why did E3, what is, this isn't E3. What did we, did we turn, a, we make a wrong turn? We ended up in like bootleg E3. Like sub Kensha Hall E3. I, I was just it, it, their their attempts to try to make it uh open to the public and try to make it work for the public just uh, were corny. Not in uh, didn't have like the games. Like if you were going to E3 cuz you heard it had games, you would get to that thing and go, "Oh, what the No, where are the I was told the new Duke Nukem would be here. Like, no, but yeah, so it's just, you know, the, the experience became um, a lot less useful, I think, for, for a lot of people. And, and as everyone started asking those questions and going to the ESA and being like, why should we keep coming to your show? They just didn't have the answers. They tried to partner with I Am 8-Bit there for that 2020 show, um, which sounds like that show, the, the pandemic did them a favor. Uh, on that one, that was a real mercy killing on that show. And then ever since then, it's just been, you know, them trying to figure something out and, and not really being able to. So it, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very sad about it. You know, that show started in 1995, that show, uh, you know, I, in, at E395, I wasn't even working for anyone. And at E three ninety six, I wasn't working for anyone. I, I I started, I think, freelancing for GameSpot not long after, not long after E three ninety six. Because and then and then I started there proper in October of ninety six. Um, and then it's just you know it's been been on ever since. But um, but before that, you know, it's like I I had my magazine job. I did, you know, but like that was CES days. That wasn't really the the first couple of years of E3. I was kind of like between things, figuring it out, whatever. Um, and uh, I think E3 was incredible. I I think that uh, it's it's sad that uh, it's sad that they couldn't figure it out. But also, I think the things they would have had to do to that show to figure it out and make it viable probably would have ruined it uh probably would have would have really taken away from the things that made it special i think you know in the, in those last few years booking interviews and stuff you would you know you would hear back from more and more people a lot of smaller devs would just be like yeah we're not going to go we're not going to e3 it's just there's nothing there's nothing there for us so so we won't be there to you know be there was at least one case, I'm trying to remember who it was, but I think there was at least one case where someone just flew out to LA to do our show, to do like the interview thing and like hang out with some friends. But like the only appearance they made was, was for the, the show we were doing at the time. Um, you would run into devs just on the floor, like that they just like their pat, you know, they got like four E3 passes and they were just like passing them around to each other. Cause they, there was a, stu you know, studio in the area and they'd be like, Oh, I got a day off. I'm going to go walk the show floor and just look around. And, and you know, you'd run into folks that, you know, were, were technically not supposed to be there, but were there. And that was always fun. Um, but you know, it, it, it was, it was fun to see the people and talk to them about what they were working on, whether that was an on the record interview thing or like the very much off the record like here's what's really going on thing. I think that's that's one of the big losses here in it, uh, is is those kind of more frank conversations. There just aren't as many places to have those. Um 
you know, GDC doesn't really offer the same type of environment. PAX is certainly, you know, not, none of the PAXs are big enough that you don't, you don't have the, the collection of developers at a PAX that you would have at E3 and prime years and, you know, the kind of the, the, the big, the big years and the GDC, it's not really, yeah, I don't know. Um, and so that's that. Uh, I, I did it. I went to every E3. I outlived E3. Congratulations to me. It's official now. I feel like that's been the thing of like, okay, well, we'll see. Um, we'll see. And I'm convinced E3 is going to come back around. You can't, you can't kill E3. They'll find a way. They will. Okay. They will find a way to brand something as E3 once again. I bet. I bet they will do it. Um, Going back to this Washington Post interview, it says, in an interview with the Washington Post, Pierre-Louis seemed well aware of the circumstances that hurt attendance. And here's a quote. Uh, there were fans who were invited to attend in the later years, but it really was about a marketing and business model for the industry and being able to provide the world with information about new products. Companies now have access to consumers and to business relations through a variety of means, including their own individual showcases. Yeah. Um... Exactly. That is that that sums it up really well. I think I think they've got a good handle on why the show doesn't need to happen. Uh, and it goes on. Yeah, I mean, it says the the business of video games has blossomed in different ways. Any one of these major companies can create an individual showcase and also partner with other industry events to showcase the breadth of games. That's exciting for our industry, and it means it's an opportunity for them to explore how to engage new audiences in different ways. For them, not for us, not for the ESA. We're done. We're finished. We're finished up. Uh, it's 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 the right move. It's a sad move. Um, and I think that you know the the uh the summer game fest thing that uh, that Keeley has been putting together. That's a big showcase that you know leads to a a good live stream. I think that's that's the most public facing thing of it is like, hey, there's this live stream, but also there is kind of a press event that has happened alongside it. Um referred to as play days, which is like a you know, it's like a two day it has been traditionally been a, a two day thing in the in the two years that it's happened. Uh that has been really great. Um at satisfying like some of the like I just I like I'm a, I'm the press let me see some games uh you know I was able to check check out like this year was like what like Alan Wake 2 was there Mortal Kombat was there Skate was there but I missed my appointment to see it and messed that up um like they were showing a hands-off armored core demo uh it was where Square showed Foam Stars for the first time Foam Stars they have fancy booths no like that's the thing like it is the vibes on it are very laid back uh and and we'll see if it can maintain that because I, I assume that that the that aspect of the show will probably continue to grow but no it is like couches around a tv it is it is a single it is largely a single room there are a handful of companies that have like larger areas that are a little more custom but it's not the big expensive loud crazy booth there's like one room that has uh, a lot of the the uh, day of the dev stuff, or this is how they've done it in the past, and and some of the like the the first year Sonic Frontiers and Street Fighter Six were on kiosks in that room as well because it was a smaller thing. The second year they expanded into a few different areas, so like Mortal Kombat was in a another room that was a up up the street a little bit and around the corner. You know, Alan Wake was in kind of its own little area as well. Uh, they had taken over a little bit more of the space uh, in in whatever center, whatever wherever that place was, and so they they were able to kind of have a few. It, it felt like all all of it felt like um, behind closed doors. E three, a lot of it had that feel to it of just like, hey, yeah, yeah, we're we're bringing people in in half hour uh, intervals to play the game for 10 minutes and then sit and watch a Q and, you know, do a Q and a, and then, you know, the next group will come through and, and, and whatever else, but like, Hey, do you have any questions? Like, you know, you're running into people, which is like a, a big part of a big part of E3 is running into people. 
and and I saw a, a lot of people um, at that thing this year, and and so it's not it's not a one to one replacement because not every publisher is there, and not every company is there, and not every company is has something ready to show, and 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 all of that. But I think as something that is kind of just starting out and is kind of two years in, um, it's perfect for me. It's perfect for me. Uh, there, there's some some stuff I would like to do kind of around the edges of, of that sort of stuff that, you know, is kind of a little more in line with the kind of traditional E3 kind of, uh, coverage. Um, but we'll see, you know, uh, and so you have that, uh, and then you have the game awards, which I, I think I've seen a lot of people say like, Oh, well, it's time to just admit that the game awards is like a winter E3. It's like, mm, it's, it's really not. I mean, it's a, it's a stream you can watch that has announcements in it, but that's such a, that's not that that's not the major portion of, of what E3 actually is and does. Um, and so I, it's, it's not a really good, it, it, that that's not a really good comparison. I don't, I don't think that that makes a ton of sense. Um, not to say the game awards don't serve a purpose or whatever, but it's not. We'll, we'll talk about the game. We'll, we'll talk about the game awards. Um, but I think if you look at, well, you know, what have we had these past few years, right? It's been Summer Games Fest. Game Fest is, is, is it's, I think it's Summer Game Fest, not Games Fest. I can never remember. But anyway, you have that thing. You have the Gamescom opening night live live stream and you have gamescom which we'll see if that still we'll see if gamescom becomes more important in the wake of this like it, I, I feel like it hasn't because i feel like the industry has been like well you know it was expensive to build a booth in los angeles it's way more expensive for us to fly everybody over you know like to go to germany so we're extra not gonna do that um and then you have the game awards for kind of like your end of the year announcements, which are really good. Those that's a really good spot. If you want to have a more compressed timeline from announcement to release. Uh, I think the, the game awards is a, is a really good launching point for that. Um, and you know, E3 is just kind of asked out a little bit. Like, I don't think PAX plays a role here. Really? Uh, PAX PAX is something that can play a really big role I think an outsized role, at least it, it, it has in the past, pre-pandemic. I haven't been to PAX in a long time. Um, for indie games, for smaller games, for, for that sort of stuff. But for like, you know, AAA publishers, what's left of them. Um, I, PAX always felt like a very weird fit. It never felt like they belonged at PAX. Like whenever there was like an EA booth at PAX, it was always like, what are you doing here? You're like, oh, you're showing a game that came out a month ago? Because you want people to buy it? Okay, yeah, all right. It's just a weird marketing thing at that point. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's all weird. It has been for a while, and, and I think everyone still has a lot to figure out. Kind of, you know, now that people are having pub, more public events again and stuff, now that that's kind of, you know, coming back um, for, for better or for worse, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to figure out in terms of, uh, what the right way to announce a video game is these days. How do you get, and, and maybe the answer is like, everyone's online now. So they'll, they'll hear the news. The right people will hear about your game. Uh, if it's of a sufficient size and you're of a sufficient publisher, people that are smaller developers that, that don't really have that, you know, that's, it's not like, you know, if Sega announces a game, any way they do it, you're probably going to hear about it sooner or later, right? Um, if if Ubisoft decides to announce a game and you follow game information, you're going to stumble into that one way or the other. But way smaller studios that don't really have that built-in audience, like sometimes, you know, like a, a, a good Sony showcase with a big chunk of indie games in the middle sometimes was a really amazing way to find out about games. And and now you'll see, you know, you see Nintendo do its third party focused uh, directs here and there and focusing on a lot of smaller games. Sony will occasionally do the same with a state of play. Um, 
I, it's not the same. I feel like it ends up not being the same unless, unless those smaller game announcements are also kind of set against like, it, like one or two really big ones. I feel like it just doesn't, it doesn't pull in a mainstream amount of eyeballs. Um, the, the way it used to, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like that's discoverability is a big problem in the industry right now. And, uh, how to get your game in front of people is a game is, is, is a problem that a lot of studios have to figure out big and small. And then once your game gets out there, how do you command attention in a, in a world, in a, in a space that is increasingly stealing the attention of plus stealing is not the right word, but in a, in a world where Fortnite and Roblox exist, you know, maybe put Minecraft on that list, maybe put GTA online on that list, but in a, in a world where we have these ongoing games that are in, in some cases free to play. How do you pull that audience? Is that, is that a different audience at this point? Is it just like there's going to be an audience of people that play Fortnite or, and or Roblox and like you can try to target them with your marketing, but you're never going to get through to them because they've, they spend all their time on Roblox and maybe they'll grow out of it someday. And hopefully if they grow out of it, they'll grow out of it into buying $70 game. You know, like I, it, I don't, I don't know. That seems like a, a really, again, I, we talked about it not that long ago, but I remember when, when Minecraft first blew up, having a couple of conversations with people who were developing games, big and small, that were just like, what the fuck do we do? If people are just going to play this game for the next 10 or 15 years, which turns out they did and are and continue to. And they're not going to, but you know, if, and they're going to barely buy any other games because suddenly they're just playing this thing that they bought for $20 10 years ago and they're still playing Minecraft. You know, what do we do? How do we make money? How, how do we, you know, like it, it's pulling consumers out of the market. I'm like, yeah. At the time, it didn't seem, it was just like, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, I think it'll end up working out fine. And it has. And it, uh, but you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's, uh, it's the questions you start to ask when you start to think like, where does the next generation of players come from and what do they want? What do they want out of game playing devices, console? Do they want consoles? Do they want a PC? What, you know, do they, what do they want in terms of types of games and, and, and all of that sort of stuff? So, um, so yeah, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of existential conversations to be had around Still, like around some of that stuff, because I, I think that, that that um that's kind of a weird thing. But you have uh, you know games that just fail to punch through, and so you you're having this this environment now where big games do big numbers, and they're terrified to change them too much because they don't want to lose their audience. They don't want to do this. And they don't do that. And they need to hit their schedule. And they, you know, like the, the call of duties of the world, which sounds like their numbers are down this year, despite them talking about engagement and how great it is. Um, but also like smaller games, you know, that, that kind of that middle scoop of like, you know, what is it like the, the, the games with the like what ten million dollar budget, the two million dollar budget, whatever, somewhere in the middle of all that. How do those studios get through to people? How do they get people to to be aware of their existence? How do they, you know, like like all that sort of stuff? And the answers are are there are you know there are always. I don't know. It kind of reminds me of the, of the music industry in some sense, where you've got the people that are out there just like getting by they're making games and they're getting by and they're doing good they're not you know they're they're selling games they're they're able to break even they're able to like they're they're kind of like having to spend more and more of their time figuring out marketing figuring out how to build a fan base for their next game that I mean, they don't even know what their next game is yet and you know there's just a lot of weird i don't know yeah, 
a lot of weird different skill sets that are coming together and and yeah that's why i say it kind of reminds me a little bit of of the music industry i suppose um word of mouth only goes so far uh lego mago says it's people like you word of mouth helps the small games but there are a million of them now yeah there are a million of them now a lot of stuff slips through the cracks um but also yeah i, I don't know you know like uh talking to people that kind of focus on indie games and, and how indie games break through and how they attract an audience. It was a lot of stuff like, Oh, like the traditional media didn't really do much for it. Even most streamers and stuff like that didn't necessarily help a game break through. It was like, you could have someone massive if they got into your game, that would kind of have a knock on effect, but it's just, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's just kind of a, uh, a weird thing. So I, I don't know, like, you know, you, you set that against all of the layoffs and you set that against everything else that's going on while also you've got some people saying like profits are great. We're laying a bunch of people off. <laughs> like, Oh, wonderful. Um, it, it's just a really weird time out there. Um, and in conclusion, all of those things I think are contributing factors to why we don't need E3 anymore. Um, on a personal level, I'm sad about it, but, um, you know, it, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. There's, there's just not really room for that type of show anymore. The, the industry is in a different place now. And I don't, I don't know what that's the, 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 the sometimes scary thing is like, I don't know what the replacement is. I don't really know what the answer is. And I don't think anyone else does either. There are, again, you know, whether it's Keeley's thing, whether it's people running their own showcases, whether it's meeting with retailers directly, all of these other little things kind of take bits and pieces of what E3 did, and maybe that's enough and maybe that's fine, but it just, I don't know, there was something, and maybe it's not real, maybe it's not real, There was, but there was something about it that felt like a show of strength from the video game industry. Uh, and that was, I, I definitely knew of people that were at publishers and stuff that really liked that aspect of it is that like, this feels real. This feels tangible. This feels like this chest beating moment for the video game industry to say, look at how big this is. And, and we're putting all of our stuff out here just to show you, look at all this amazing stuff coming out. This is the best industry in the world. And that the mainstream would would take a little bit more notice of it than normal because of just how big that it got. Um, and I think that there's there is there's some intangible value to that, but at the same time, that feels like the same mentality that we used to deal with back in the print magazine days, where we were saying, "Hey, we have like." Our, our website homepage has more people looking at it on a daily basis than this print magazine is seen all month long. Like our, our daily traffic beats that magazine's circulation by like fucking three to five times. You should be giving your exclusives to us. We will get it out to a much larger audience than if you go put it on the cover of Game Informer or EGM or, or whatever. But video game companies were, and in some cases definitely still are, run by a bunch of old men. And you know what old men understood back then? Holding a magazine in their hands and going, that's my video game. <laughs> put it on the wall. You can't put a website on a wall. And so we lost all of those exclusives, even though we were so much bigger <laughs> than those print magazines at the time. Um, simply because, and, and, and so that's at, at, at literally the marketing team, the, the, the ad team at GameSpot for a while there, they were printing out the homepage and putting it in a frame and mailing it to publishers. And, and you know, it was usually for ad campaigns. It was like, look at your homepage takeover. There was one that was hanging in the office. It may, it's probably fucking still there somewhere for like doom three <laughs> it was like the GameSpot homepage the day that doom three launched um 
and they, and it was like, look at Doom Three all over the home, and, and they they sent it to publishers, this or their whoever bought the ads to be like, look at what your money got you, because they couldn't understand because it was the internet. And they're like, I looked at it and it was gone. I was like, oh, it was yesterday. What do you mean it was yesterday? We only get one day with a magazine. I get a month. And you would have magazines try to talk about their pass along readership and like, well, our confirmed circulation is, you know, 300,000, but everyone takes that magazine and hands it to at least two people. So we think it's really like this. And he's like, fuck you. Bullshit. <laughs> That's like a podcast trying to say like, well, 20% of our listeners listen with the speakers on and people walk by. So they might hear your ads too. Like, ridiculous um so you know i that is my i guess my long-winded way of saying the industry changed it's it's better in a lot of ways but it's also i think there's a lot of spooky stuff still happening right now um obviously right i mean you know th there's a there's a problem with the health of this industry the layoffs across the board uh tell a pretty clear tale right that despite like oh, all these numbers are going up and up and up and you know you see games falling off you know like the the bungee layoffs were supposedly because they were off on their numbers you know that they were was there like 45 percent below where they needed to be or or whatever it was that's the 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 talk right um and you can look at that and go, I guess that makes sense. I mean, Destiny 2 has been out for a long time. If you look at the track record of people being happy about Destiny 2, it, it's the conversation turned at some point a few years ago. And, you know, you started to hear more negative than positive. No one hates Destiny 2 more than fans of Destiny 2. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, and I think that if you replicate that across, like, all of the other live service games and everything else, like, you know, you, you end up, you know, you know where you're like one expansion away from fucking up your game. And then you're like, uh Oh, now what we had planned to do this for another six years, but now we are in a hole. Now, what do we do? Whereas at least when people were just putting out games and shipping them and moving on to the next game, uh, the, the game could only do so much damage on its way down. <laughs> right. Um, a game would come out, and it, if it tanks, you're like, well, we got th six more coming out. Maybe they'll like Dr. Mudo. Get Dr. Mudo. Maybe they didn't like Dr. Mudo. Fuck. <laughs> We're rebooting Defender, everybody. We think this is going to be a big deal. We got this. We got the suffering. PsyOps. So we, we think one of these will be a cult hit that people like, but it's not going to sell for shit. Probably going to be PsyOps. Anyway... Mortal Kombat will do fine. Hope for the best. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. Like the 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 stakes for every game, especially when we get into the live service thing, the the high stakes of like, oh, if you you put a lot into this game up front, and you were planning on it being your thing for the next five to ten years, and it didn't do that. So now, what do you do? That's rough. Um, and the, the stakes for that only get higher, right? I mean, the, the live service thing, like uh, set aside, I think the people who are just like live service games are, uh, uh, um, I think even in the most positive light, you know, you're trying to pull someone away from the live service game. They're already playing one of the two or three that they're already playing and saying like, come play this one instead. And it's the problem that MMOs used to have uh, with a lower barrier to entry because they're not really subscription-based anymore and a lot of times they can be free-to-play and whatever. But, like, this was the problem that, you know, like in a post-World of Warcraft environment, the MMO community went through some version of this, right? Where they're like, oh, shit. Like, WoW sucked up all the players who were looking for a new game. Um, it pulled in players who had never played one of these before, which that's good because maybe we can peel them off someday. But, you know, if you're EverQuest or something like that and, and World of Warcraft comes out, you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> they, they made it, though. They pulled through. It didn't kill them. It killed a lot of their games. 
but then you would have you know you, you would have this situation where what, what was the I can say Firefall, but no, like I feel uh, Wild Star, right? Wild Star was that the name of it? Uh, yeah. Like there were just there were a lot of games that were coming out that the people were like, "This is going to be the one that kills World of Warcraft," and everyone's going to leave WoW to play this one instead. And you're like, "No, it's not. It, it's any anytime you're marketing your game is like it's the blank killer, you fucked up." No one killed Halo. I mean, you could argue for a while there that it was the the call was coming from inside the house or whatever you want to call it there. But they, you know, hey, Halo Infinite's gotten back on track and and people seem super psyched for it these days, which is which is awesome. Um But like now what? Are you, I mean, and, and, and this, this actually is a really interesting week to have this conversation because the words I was about to say are what's going to be the Minecraft killer. And maybe it'll be Lego Fortnite. Maybe. Fortnite expanded, uh, over the course of their whole, um, Uh, a big universe thing they have expanded to add a bunch of additional games to it. One of them being Lego Fortnite, which is a survival game uh, with a sandbox mode if you just want to build stuff. Um, one of them is Rocket Racing, which is a racing game from the Rocket League developers, but it's a much more straightforward racing game. With a little bit of the flippy, jumpy stuff from Rocket League, but maybe not enough of it. And then you've got Fortnite Festival, which is Harmonix making a rock band-esque game. And they all exist inside of Fortnite. When you launch the Fortnite launcher, it's been like this for a while now. When you launch Fortnite, there's been pages and pages of user-made experiences and all this other custom weird stuff. Uh, that people have made um, in addition to the official modes of like what play Fortnite, play save the world Fortnite, play zero build Fortnite, and then like ranked variants of that. And now they've got this other stuff like you go launch Fortnite uh, and it's it's inside of that. Like if you go to the Epic client, you can see Lego Fortnite there. But when you launch it, it just brings you to the Fortnite launcher. When you launch, when you, if you want to play Fortnite Festival, you launch Fortnite and then pick Fortnite Festival. It loads and goes, and uh, and and goes like that. Lego Fortnite, I think they broke out separately in a slightly different way, but it still launches inside of the Fortnite launcher and 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 everything else. Um. And so Fortnite is a platform. It's weird. Um, but when I, yeah, when, when I basically, uh, and, and people in chat keep saying, no, they're all broken out. They're all separate downloads. Like when I launched the Epic store, the two things I see are Fortnite and Lego Fortnite. When I went to go install Fortnite festival, it did not add it to a list or of installed games or, or anything like that. Like that's, that's, they, they're not treating it like that on PC. Maybe it's different on console, but I, I haven't, I don't care about Fortnite on consoles. Um, so they've 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 basically built three new big games that they are saying these are permanent additions to the lineup. We are going to be continuing to add things onto these in the future, and there you go. And so I that finally got me to reinstall Fortnite. It's been a while. Um, I, well, I think I, I think I installed it when Zero Build came out, and I played like it twice. I played like two rounds of that, and went like, "Yep, yeah, you sure don't build." I guess that's okay. Um, they seem early in some ways, but also, you know, they, they seem like they're pulling in big numbers in terms of like giving the Fortnite audience more to do. Uh, they show the number of people that are playing each experience. And so if you trust those numbers, then there was like one and a half million people playing Lego Fortnite when I looked at it, uh, last night. Um, and 
Yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. Like uh, Lego Fortnite is probably the most fleshed out of the three, or the or the most substantial, I guess I would say. Um, and you know, you 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 kind of build these prefab buildings in it, and they have you go through this process of like, okay, now get you know, if you 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 okay, you go punch a tree. Literally, it's it is a fucking it is a tree punching game same as all the others like you you know you eventually build tools you can use to cut the trees but straight up at the beginning of the game i was punching a tree and going like here we go again another tree puncher um and then you end up with like 25 wood and then you go oh i need that to build a a, a hut or i need i need to build a shack here and then when you hit the build me a shack button it says okay and then it has you place like parts, like prefab parts. Like here's the wall, here's the roof, here's the different pieces of the roof, here's the floor, here's this. Place this, place this, place this. Now go to step two and place this, 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 and this. Now go to step three and place this, then this, this, and this. And then eventually your shack is done and everyone is thrilled. You know, it's like you're building beds so that villagers can live in your town. Um, And and that they'll stay there if they've got a bed. You know, AI AI villagers will come and 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 stay in your town. You can send them out on missions. Uh, as you get additional resources, you get additional recipes, and so you can build. You know, now I can build a wood carving station that turns wood into planks, and then planks help me build better wood material and then eventually you're going to get built you know like you work your way up this kind of like tech tree or whatever and build yourself a village your village levels up as you go and that will attract more villagers so there's kind of an aspect of like and they kind of hint at it there's like a character in your town that will talk to you occasionally and she says like if you want this cat to come live in your town you need to build a lot of furniture and so it's like okay you know if I, if I, if I meet these village goals then different things will happen almost like you know, like people keep using the words Viva Pinata when they describe that aspect of the game. And yeah, yeah, it's a little bit like that. Um, and a lot of your characters from Fortnite come into it in Lego form. I'm not happy with the way my character looks uh, in Lego form because my character has like a snake eyes looking visor and like a snow parka or something. And then when he comes into Lego Fortnite, he just looks like a dude with hair, you know, he just, he's the, the mask, none of that stuff is there. And I was like, oh, okay. I don't, hmm. all right, weird. Um, the Lego style does work because, you know, like eventually you're, you are kind of, you can just kind of build stuff as well. You know, you have kind of for these smaller, just basic Lego block foundations that you can slap things together, uh, with as well. And it's got, you know, you, if you're playing in the survival mode, you've got hunger, you've got temperature. So if you are, you know, if you are far away from your campfire, you're going to get cold and slowly take damage. And so the, the one thing is I, I, I thought it was going to be a very Minecraft kind of thing of like, once you build a bed, you can go lay in the bed at night and then make it daytime again. But that did not happen. Uh, there are wolves and skeletons, and sometimes you pick up a rock and there's a tiny survive, uh, a tiny spider under it. You gotta punch the spider, and the spider drops silk, and then you can make stuff out of that. And you pick corn, and you, the corn drops vines, and then you've got vines. You can make stuff out of vines, and so it, it's one of those games. It also has caves. I found a cave. I don't have the gear to go explore in a cave right now. Uh, it's weird when you go find a cave, you there's a loading screen. Like you walk up to the cave entrance and hit enter and then it shows this long entrance animation and then eventually it loads and you come out the other side uh, inside the cave. Um, but I didn't have a light with me. So I was like, well, I got to get out of here. And so I, I haven't really done much exploring yet. It feels very basic, but like also like just robust enough to where you're like, okay, like this feels substantial. It feels like there's something to this. And if they continue to build upon it, it will probably continue to be a pretty popular thing. Um, and I think that's, that's the most substantial of, of the new things they've introduced. I, it's cool. Like I I'm having a good time with it. 
you know, in, in so far as sometimes I just want to punch a rock and do a thing like it, it's all right. I don't know. I haven't really gotten any good weapons or anything to go do proper combat with. And so when I see a wolf, I run away. Um, and it's, it's neat. I, I will probably keep messing with it. There's also, uh, rocket racing, which is a pretty straightforward racing game. Um, some of you, if you have a bunch of unlocked stuff in Rocket League, some of it, I think, comes in. I don't have a lot of Rocket League stuff. Um, but I, I got, like, a blue dune buggy Rocket League-looking car. Um, and a few sets of decals to put upon it. Um, and it's a drift, you know, you hit a button. You, as you're turning a corner, you hit a button to start a drift. As you start that drift, a meter fills up, and when you straighten out again, you will boost automatically in a kind of Mario Kart-like style. Uh, you will also fill a turbo meter as you're doing it for, you know, if you want to hit a button to activate turbos on straightaways, you can you can do that. Um, and occasionally there are uh, roads on the walls, and so if you you hit the the X button, the yeah, the, or the A button, I guess, if you're on an Xbox controller. Uh, the car will jump. You can do those kind of squirt boosts to fly a little bit. And you can also do an air dodge. If you do an air dodge towards one of these roads on the sides of the walls, you will flip around and stick to it. And so you can drive on the walls and the ceiling and, and everything that way in, in tracks that require that, you know, the, the most of the tracks I've been on so far have not had much of that, but the tutorial does have you do a little bit of that. Um, so it feels very straightforward. It put it just it'll throw you into a uh, a multiplayer thing, and you'll race other cars, and you'll drift, and they'll drift, and you'll all drift, and it it feels fine. Like it it, it works as well as, uh, you know, like the, the it's it has a, a decent number of tracks in it from the looks of it. I didn't spend a ton of time with it, but it it seems like it's um, I would put it maybe on par with not quite but it's it's pretty close to like a hot wheels unleashed to the level of detail on the tracks is not as detailed as as hot wheels was but just in the, the brief period of time I've, I've played both games i'm even you know i'm not a hot wheels unleashed to expert um but i would probably rather play rocket racing than hot wheels unleashed 2 i guess it felt pretty good like the the car handling feels feels nice so so that's that. And there are not a lot of, you know, not a lot of the go, those games come out anymore. So it's actually kind of cool to have just like, here's a racing game and fuck it. It's free. Like, oh, weird. Um, and then Fortnite festival is the third thing. And it's the, it's weird. I I'm of like, I'm, I'm of a few different minds when it comes to Fortnite festival on one hand, I hope that the people at Harmonix, I, I hope it's a good big thing for them and they get to keep working on something for a good long time and stay employed and, and, and do their thing. I hope that this, this works out because it just feels like Harmonix has been through the ringer for so many years. Uh, they could use some good news over there. That's, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm making that up, but it's just, I don't know. This feels it just feels like Harmonix has just been through some shit, you know? Um, it's, it is rock band superficially. Um, right now you play it with a controller or your keyboard. They have said that getting proper instrument support in is one of their priorities for next year. And that'll be huge. If it actually starts to support instruments, I don't know how, I don't, you know, that seems like it would be very hard to support a lot of old instruments on console, but on PC at least that probably won't be an issue. So hopefully they'll just support stuff and, and, and whatever. But, um, when you start a game of Fortnite festival, it defaults to go into matchmaking and you go to a lobby with three other players and then you and the other players build a set list. There are tracks, there are, there's music that is kind of available for free on like a daily 
uh, a daily rotation of tracks that are available, but also you can buy tracks for 500 V dollars. And if you own a track, you can then you can add it. Everyone gets to add, I think one track to the list or whatever. And then you pick an instrument in difficulty and the instruments, you know, it's, it's vocals, which I think is still a keyboard thing. It's drums, bass, guitar, I think guitar on songs that support it. Um, and then you pick a difficulty from easy, medium, hard or expert. And then you play it and everyone can have a different difficulty and they can all play the same instruments or whatever. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it does the thing where if you are playing it wrong, the music stops, you know, it doesn't feel like they're splitting up the stems and doing all of that work there. Um, but also, I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to tell. It's, it's my keyboard's very loud. <laughs> so like as I'm clacking my keyboard to do it, I'm like, I, you know, these drums sound fine to me. Okay. So it does, it does stop on your end. Okay. All right. It didn't sound very dramatic. I'll say that much. Um, there are not a lot of songs in the game right now. And obviously it's a brand new thing. Um, I bought party rock anthem by LMFAO. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's this weird. It doesn't feel good. It feels, it feels wrong. It feels weird. It doesn't feel, I don't know. Harmonix has made some incredible games over the years. This doesn't feel like, like, and you've seen a lot of people going like, holy shit, it's Rock Band 5. Like, no, it's like Rock Band 0 0.5. Like, it, it's it's got the basics of the gameplay there, it's got a very bare bones approach to it. It, you know, you build overdrive, you activate it. There's some gameplay involved in activating all of your band overdrive at the same time. And, you know, and, you know, getting a higher multiplier and, and all of that stuff. It doesn't feel like the next step from harmonics. It feels like harmonics is know how being applied to this thing for Fortnite. Um, and maybe that'll feel different when the instrument support is in there. Uh, how does it deal with player lag in, in festival? I think you just don't, you don't care how the other players are doing. Really? The only thing th I don't think you hear them fucking up. I think it, at most it sounds like you hear, you maybe hear yourself fucking up, but even that didn't seem, um, didn't seem massive. So it, it, there's, and, and in there you get a lot more cosmetics as well because you're, you're Fortnite characters. So this is why they added all of the ratings to Fortnite characters, uh, that you, you may have noticed that like individual skins were getting kind of blocked from certain experiences. It's because they are not allowing like extreme skins to be used in uh in Le like Lego Fortnite or whatever. You're like, oh, you can't bring Al M rated Alan Wake into this. You can't if a guy's got a gun strapped to him, he doesn't get, you know, like there's there's aspects there where they they kind of uh limit that sort of stuff. But like, yeah, the 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 latency stuff is is not that big of a deal because at most when you're interacting with other players, it's because you are activating overdrive around the same time to try to get your band score higher or whatever. But because it just matches, I mean, if you if you're playing with friends, and maybe you're on voice chat and maybe you care. Um, but it just matches you up with random people and, and you're like, okay, whatever. Um, it doesn't really seem like the, the, the networking aspect of it does not seem like a huge, a huge deal. Um, if you're playing on expert, you know, you can get, you can get five stars. You can also get gold stars, you know, if you're, if you're doing well enough. So it, it, it carries over that kind of concept, but like it doesn't, you know, this doesn't feel like a step forward. This doesn't feel like, you know, the next great rhythm game from harmonics. This feels like, again, taking harmonics 
bread and butter, very normal stuff that they have done for years and years and putting it into this game right for now. Right. I mean, ideally they keep building upon it and they get there. They, like they said, they want to add instrument support next year, which I assume at that point, because you see, there's, there's, you see live streams of people playing this and they're playing it with a fucking rock band guitar. And then you watch them and you realize, oh, they're not strumming anything because they've just used joy to key to map buttons to, to the guitar. And they're just tapping like this. And that's stupid. You look like a dumbass when you do this. You fucking idiots. You look like fucking idiots doing this. Stupid ass. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, I, yeah. So, like, when they add actual instrument support, uh, that could be pretty cool. Uh, in the meantime, just use your fucking keyboard. Stupid. What are you doing? Ugh. Um... I, I hope that they keep expanding upon it. I think that the pricing uh, for tracks seems... Uh, let's look up V-Buck prices here real quick because 500 V-Bucks for a song seemed fucking crazy. Um... Let's see here. Let's load it up. How much is a thousand V bucks will cost you? Eight ninety nine. So nine dollars for two songs. That's four fifty a track. And, and I assume if you buy more V bucks, you get a better, you know, best deal. Uh, so, so that, that makes sense, I suppose. Um, But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It just, uh, it, it feels like they kind of limped in with this one, I guess I would say. And it doesn't feel like I, the other two games feel strong. I feel like the rocket racing probably needs more tracks as well. A uh, different kind of track, but, uh, Lego Fortnite feels like very well realized for what it is. You know, does it, do you see like little aspects that are probably going to need to be improved? Sure. But, uh, but Fortnite festival just feels. <sighs> As someone who has spent a lot of money on rock band over the years and is willing to spend more money on rock band and in, in the future, like something about this doesn't feel right. Because I don't feel like I, I, I need to be shown that it's going to get there. I need to know it's going to get where it needs to be. Uh, before it feels right. And um, I, I just don't know. Like there's something about it being attached to this kind of other big live service monster. Something about songs on the battle pass feels weird. It just Yeah, I don't know. It, it's, well, I guess it's a festival pass. Sorry festival pass. Um, and so I just, I, I feel like they, they have, they certainly have something here. You'll play it. Go, you go play it. You should go play it. it. It's neat. And it's weird to see Fortnite being repurposed in this highly fucking strange way. Um, because your Fortnite character comes in during parts where your instrument doesn't have anything to do. You can emote. If you want to watch your guide dance, um, but it's not what it needs to be. And it, when they add proper instrument support, I think that'll be a, you know, that'll be interesting, but also there's just something I, I don't, I, I don't think it's something as simple as just like, I don't like that it's attached to Fortnite, but also that is, there's, there's some aspect of it that you just. It feels very impermanent. It feels very much like, look at this little thing that could disappear tomorrow. And then, of course, Epic got out there and said, these are not limited time modes. These are here to stay, so on and so forth. But I don't know. Maybe it's the Epic layoffs. Maybe it's all the other stuff that you just like, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I believe you. They could lay off all of harmonics tomorrow if they decided this wasn't, uh, 
if this wasn't a going concern and shut it all down and and then what? They're going to give me back my V bucks so that I can spend them on fucking what Peter Griffin skin, I, you know, whatever the fuck other dumb shits in there. Like, I, I don't, I don't know. It's, um, and you know, the, and, and it comes with like the, the, the other thing that launched alongside this is you can play as the weekend. If you buy, if you buy him, if you purchase him, you can play as him, I suppose, or he's on the festival pass or whatever it is. I, I'm not, there is a way to play as the weekend. I don't know if you can play as him in, in proper Fortnite or not. Uh, I assume so, but this is weird. It's weird. It doesn't feel good. It does the, the rock band, the, the gameplay doesn't feel especially challenging. It feels cold because you're being match made with strangers and you're just like cobbling together a set list and going like, I, I'm sure, you know, you obviously you could rectify that by playing with friends, but you know, I, you just hit the button and you end up with these strangers and you don't really see them while you're playing and, and they, their presence in the song doesn't matter. Uh, and it, it just, it doesn't, it feels very antisocial in a way that rock band was never meant to be. They need local, they need local co-op. I mean, probably, right? I mean, if, if they really want to build this into the thing that it was, and they probably don't, they probably don't really care about that at a, at a high level. The best part about those games was playing with other people in the same room. And Rock Band, over the years, added online support, and you could theoretically play it online. That was always like something I just looked at. I was like, why would you do this? I can just play it alone. Like I'm, I'm getting, I'm gaining nothing by playing it with another person. Um, online, I might as well just play it alone. And it just, the whole thing feels a little cold. I guess that's actually probably my issue with it. Uh, whether it's the UI, the interface, like it doesn't feel like, and in other parts of Fortnite feel much better about this. So I don't know what it is about this one in particular that they just went with this very sterile presentation or, or whatever it is. There is another experience related to Fortnite festival called jam mode. Um, that when I was reading the description of it, I was like, Oh, cool. This'll be awesome. And then I loaded into it and I was like, this is, not awesome jam mode you it, it, like is ostensibly like fuser because it breaks the parts ap uh, apart into stems and lets you mix them together but when you go do jam mode stuff you're just kind of and, and i'm sure there's different ways to do it if you're partying up with friends or whatever when i launched it it just basically just like threw me into an environment that had a bunch of other players in it there were a bunch of glowing circles at different spots on the in, in, in the area and when you're in those circles you can say i want to play you like you you load your like fuser you would load your backpack full of songs a limited number like eight songs six songs whatever it is uh and then when you are in those circles, you can say, I want to play the bass part of this song. And then someone else could run into that circle and say, I'm going to play the drum part from this song. And then someone else could say, I'm going to play the vocal part from this song. And so I guess if you, but like the thing about Fuser was, you know, changing the parts up on the fly and doing cool remixing and all of this other stuff. This is more like you are standing there and then, Someone only has the two free Fortnite songs that came with it, and they're just playing that drum track over and over again. And you're like, "Well, okay, I guess I'll run to a different circle." Oh, they're just doing that there too. Okay, all right. Uh, I don't really know why we want to. I don't really know why we want to do that, but th there's no gameplay to it. Is my point. Um, and so you're just kind of at the mercy of what other songs people are playing in that circle. And, uh, and that's that. 
I don't know. It, it, it feels like this. It feels like a very half baked sort of thing. Like I wish that there was also something that was like, oh, and here's the fuser mode that you actually want. Like, yes. Okay, fine. Here we go. Now we're talking. Um, it's funny to see a music game, a rhythm game ship on a platform that has built in anti cheat. Like there's some accountant somewhere that's like, yeah, this is no one's ever going to put custom fucking music into this thing. No one's ever going to steal songs from Rock Band 2 or Guitar Hero World Tour and play them in our game. We've done it. We've locked it down. We have figured it out. Of course, maybe people will rip these songs out of this and then go play them in Clone Hero, but who the hell knows if that is a doable thing or not. So the song selection is weird. Also, there's a lot of half-baked stuff about the UI. Because the the UI where you go to see what songs are available um, is the same as like seeing like what skins are available. And so it's a terrible way to look at the music and figure out what music is even in the game for purchase. Uh, so they need to overhaul that aspect of the game quite a bit. Um, and we'll see if they, I mean, I, I assume they'll get there. Someone has to, someone, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not some big smart guy. That like the UI is like it's it's plainly clear that this is not a great UI for finding and purchasing music. It's terrible. So uh, hopefully they'll over overhaul that sooner rather than later. Um, because it's the whole that whole thing is just funky. And so I yeah I don't know man it's it's crazy. It'd be interesting if this, you know, will this end up being popular enough because it's attached to Fortnite that it ends up bringing back a major level interest in this style of rhythm game and blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, man. It's just such a weird. I really want to like it. I really want to like it because it's cool. Like it's cool to see a harmonics rhythm product back in the marketplace in any way, shape or form. That at least like that they're saying, you know, again, like, hey, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to add actual real instrument support into this so that you dummies don't have to just tap it out. Well, you know, they'll make the strum bar work. Duh. What are you even doing? Tapping the neck of your guitar. You look stupid. You look like a bunch of stupid asses. Um, so. When it gets there, we'll see. What well, like that? I think that'll be the the big test of it, right? Is is when they add actual instrument support. What does that look like? And how does that feel? And what what do they do to just liven it up again for something that you know? And and some of it's the music selection, I guess. And I don't know. You end up in a situation where it's like, okay, like great songs in rock band are usually rock songs more often than not. But what type of music do you want to put in a Fortnite game? And how do you, it's, it's, it's just a lot of, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, hmm. yeah. Uh, so, so that's out. I, I, I do again, I, I think you should install it and, and, and take a look at it because it is like all of it, all of it is worth going and looking at because it's, it's crazy to see, Fortnite turned into all of this sort of stuff. Um, it's like a bizarre, it's a bizarre creation really. But, uh, but yeah, it's uh, the, 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 some of it's more successful than others. And, and obviously all of it is subject to change as they continue to build upon it and, and whatever else. But like, I really want to see Fortnite festival get to a better place than it is now because it's neat but when I went even just going back to play it a second time I was like oh I don't I don't know I don't think I want to do and I had I don't know where I got them but I had 1500 uh v bucks and so I had enough for to buy a song and I was like well all right I'll spend it on this and it was just like I this it's weird. Feels weird. Uh, speaking of weird video games, 
uh, civil engineering, S E B I L. I heard people talk about civil engineering and I kept looking for a game called civil engineering, but it is not called civil engineering. It is called civil uh, engineering and it's on steam and it is, uh, It's a bonkers little broken puzzle game. It's an early access. It's a mess. I think it's definitely worth checking out um, because of the exact type of mess that it is. But basically, there is a, you know there are cars spawning on one part of a level, and there is an area that you need to make sure the cars get to, and you have very limited control over the heights of parts of the map. And so you are kind of raising up parts of the road to try to make the cars turn and try to, or jump over a building so they can get to where they need to go. And, and basically you're trying to connect the start to the finish. And eventually they get to a point where there's, you know, a, a, a intersection and there's cars going one way and buses going the other. And that's even the, like the first level has that as a variant. And, and you have to figure out how to make it happen. But it is this physics nightmare of making these cars go all over the place. It's got, uh, it's, it's, it's got text speech voice in there squaring at you at the start of every level, just coming in and telling you what the job is and it's going like, and these, how many times do I need to explain it to you? Fuck up, you know, like whatever else it, it's, it's got a really amazing vibe to it. You can spawn in the, like if you, you have no camera control, which is a fucking disaster. So like you're trying to raise things that are on the other side of the level and you're like, I can't fucking even really see what I'm trying to do here. So instead there's like a little survey thing you can plop down and that spawns you on the map itself. And then you can walk around and you can still raise and lower things while you're walking around, but it's such a different broken ass perspective that it's like also fucked in hilarious ways. And also you can get hit by the cars and die when you're doing that, which is bizarre. Um, it's a mess. Uh, it's an early access. And I hope that in early access, they find ways to continue to make sure it stays a mess. But there are also parts of the game that probably need to be a little bit better than they are. I don't know if camera control is one of them, I, I but it, it, there's just, it's a funky mess. Uh, it's a fun little puzzle game. Um, and you can blow up the cars with a gun if you spawn in the first person mode. It's very, it's very silly. It's very silly. Uh, also very silly. It's been out for a while and I finally got around to it. This is, you know, when we talk about games that, that slip through the fucking cracks, man. I had this game installed for months and finally, finally, finally loaded up Super 56. Uh, which is on Steam. And I'm going to say for $7, I am going to say I highly recommend Super 56. It is a, let's call it a WarioWare-like. Uh, it is 56 mini games. There is a, an overarching story of you uh, visiting hell on a cultural exchange program, and, and this is the video game they have in hell, but your, your friends can't play it because they don't have thumbs. Uh, and so it is a micro game collection that you play with one button. All of the games are, even the menus are one button menus, though you can use the D-pad in the menus if you like, because they... They are not monsters in that specific way. Um, but it's basically you can either tap the button or hold the button. And so they build a bunch of mini games around that. You, there are you, you. One of them is basically the fishing from Animal Crossing. With a, an art style that is very much them. S stealing the art style of Animal Crossing. It's no mosh, um, but like it is. It's got a bunch of ridiculous mini games in it. Some of them I could not figure out before I lost them. So I was like, all right, well, you know, I need to go back and figure that out. Uh, it speeds up as you play it. You are unlocking some random kind of character customization stuff for the leaderboards as you play, which is, you know, it's, it's whatever. Uh, but it's got, I think it's got a really great visual style to it. I think the writing is fun. Uh, and 
the one button thing is funny. <laughs> like, you know, there's, it's an arch, there's one's an archery game where, you know, the, the guy is constantly aiming the arrow up and down and you hold the button down to determine strength and you're trying to hit apples. I guess some very basic gameplay in there as well. But I think there's been a lot of those, a bit, there have been a lot of like games that are trying to evoke WarioWare in one way or the other that either, that, that basically suck. There's been a lot of bad WarioWare style games that kind of miss the point. This game is definitely doing its own thing in conjunction with the WarioWare concepts, but also uh, it's fantastic. It's just fun, goofy, like good sense of humor, all of that sort of stuff. So Super 56, I think you should check it out if you haven't. It came out back in October. Um, you should give it a look. Um, and with that, we can get into the rest of the news. Uh, there's been little bits and pieces of PlayStation 5 Pro news with uh, leakers. The leak squad. Uh, has has kind of uh, commented on on some of this stuff. The implication being that there are some specs floating around out there. Someone asked a Tom Henderson about this stuff, who had been talking a bit about some of this leak stuff lately. He is, yeah, uh, he is in that scene of of leaks, and uh, and basically he says in he said on a Twitter. Internally, Sony is expecting full specs to leak this month because of dev kit distribution to third-party studios. Um, hard to know the 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 basics of the specs as as far as what I read, but the the basics is the you know a big increase in the GPU uh, capabilities, a minor bump on the CPU side, but but a, a big focus on on GPU that would include features. Uh, that are akin to NVIDIA's DLSS type stuff, that kind of like AI enhanced uh, upscaling uh, technology, not just the kind of basic FSR stuff that AMD has done in the, in the past. Um, at the end of the day, I'll just say, I don't know, maybe. I'm not even, you know, but 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 I guess the, the larger point here uh, is that because of the increasing specificity of some of these leaks, you do have to kind of consider that this probably means that there will be a PlayStation 5 Pro, which I'm still like, Ugh, I don't know that they should do this. Um, But yeah, according to Tom's hardware, who was kind of breaking the specs down a little bit, um, the GPU is, it kind of sits between the RDNA 3 and RDNA 4 architectures. It will pull in some of the ray tracing improvements that are a, going to be a part of RDNA 4, which is not available yet, that will help with ray tracing, like hardware acceleration of ray tracing and a few other features along those lines. Um, and again, along with a, some kind of, they refer to it here as a bespoke temporal machine learning upscaling technique made by Sony. Um, so something similar to a DLSS, some kind of hardware enhanced upscaling, uh, that would allow them to hit 4k, uh, at reasonable frame rates with ray tracing, blah, blah, blah. That's the idea, right? Um, And that it's a slightly faster Zen 2 CPU clocked at 4.4 gigahertz is the the other kind of specific detail in in this stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? We'll see. I I don't. There's, there's again. I, I think there's something about the concept of a PS5 Pro that feels very. I don't know. I guess it feels less like a problem because the, the, as time goes on, we will get closer and closer to something that feels like the 
midpoint of a console generation. And so the, the idea of a pro console won't seem quite as bad, but when this rumor first started kicking around, you know, it just, it felt like the generation hasn't really even gotten started yet. I feel a little bit differently about that now. I'm not quite sure why I think just enough time has passed, but, um, I don't know. I think the the PS five is still, you know, is this something that comes in conjunction with a price drop to the baseline PS five is, do they prepare for that? And do they sell a pro for 500? Do they try and bump to six? Like what, you know, there's just, there's how much more, how many more dollars can you attach to a PlayStation five skew? And still have the market accept that. And yeah, what, and, and, you know, yeah, I guess that's, that also bears the question. Like what is, what is the game that Sony is working on that will showcase this? What, uh, what new game will come along, uh, to say like, Hey, here's, here's, yeah. Someone saying Wolverine. Sure. Like what first party Sony product will come out that you just go like, oh shit. Now it makes sense. I don't know that the PS4 Pro had that game really per se. Like the improvements weren't bad. The improvements were valuable and over time the improvements became standard, right? Because the the base level PS4 kind of got left behind a little bit. Um Yeah, we'll see. Um, we'll, we'll see how it all goes. Yeah. Horizon was a game that they wanted to be the, the PS4 pro game back in the day. Yeah. Bloodborne running at 60 frames per second. That, that would be enough to sell it to some folks, right? Um, this is probably slightly less of an improvement over the Xbox Series X because that's one of those things where the Xbox Series X is technically more capable than the PS5 in, in specific ways that end up not really mattering because everyone just targets the lowest common denominator, blah, blah, blah. And, um, it, does, it does kind of, every time this comes up, it does kind of re-ask the question of will Microsoft follow? And they've said in the past that no, they're not. Um, if this ends up feeling like a substantial upgrade though, I feel like they will almost be forced to respond. I don't know. Or, or will they, I, maybe not, man. I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about, I, I, I don't feel good about any of this, which I guess is, uh, but also with all of that in mind, I also don't feel great about performance of games on these consoles. So if we get out there with something that's going to run games better, if we get out there with something that's going to bring ray tracing to the masses and lead to more ray tracing and more games because more platforms will support it, uh, in a performant way, uh, that's probably still a good thing, but, um, right now it feels weird. I don't know. Like you need the whole story. That's, that's kind of the, the thing about a lot of leaks over the years. And I, I've definitely been in situations where like something is leaked that we've been like under embargo on and you almost get mad about it. Well, you do get mad about it because you're sitting on your hands going, well, we're, well this is bullshit. Like we should just be able to report what we have. Um, I was like, no, we've signed a thing. We're fucked. Uh, and they're, they're making people hold the embargo, even though this very detailed leak came out or whatever, but like the, you know, the, it's when it's a situation where like one piece of the puzzle leaks and people get super pissed about it and you're sitting there with the rest of the story going, it's actually not that bad. Well, if you knew everything about it, you'd go like, oh, okay. But instead everyone's getting pissed off. And then the, the person that you signed the embargo with is like, oh, we're going to stick to the original time. I'm like, okay, like your reputation's being fucking ripped to shreds out there. I would think you would just say, Hey, let's get the whole story out there because people are jumping to the wrong conclusion. But what the fuck do I know? Um, whatever. That's, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Uh, 
we'll see. I the the the, the PlayStation Five Pro. I I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't. It 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 feels. Uh, it, it still feels a little weird. Um, this, uh, this story from Tom's hardware implies that the console could be announced as early as 2024, but well, I don't know if, if everyone's getting dev kits now, if we assume that that is the case, that updated dev kits are getting out there and not just specs or, or whatever else, then I don't know. Do they give people a year and a half to make games on it? Do they do they reveal at GDC next year and then ship in the fall? Or uh or what? Cuz maybe by fall, maybe by next year, the idea of an upgraded PlayStation 5 will feel a little less insane. We'll see. Like I said, this, there's something about it that just doesn't quite feel right, but, you know. Um, that was something, when, you know, because it, it was GDC when we started getting all the leaks about the PS4 Pro, and I had, I had a bunch of uh, articles and, and material that was printed out from, the, or not printed out, I didn't have printouts, I had like PDFs or something, but um, that were taken off of Sony's uh, like outward facing developer site. So like third party developers can log into a site and see detailed information about the consoles that they're developing for and find technical information and whatever else. And so that had been updated with like, here's the, here's the details on PS4 pro. But then also there were people out there just talking about it at GDC because it was GDC and that's what people do. Um, and so it was a weird, like it, yeah, it was just kind of leaked from like four different angles, I guess, at that point. Um, the day before, some sort of zombie game that people somehow got excited for. Even though when you go look at it, you go like, why is it kind of just the Last of Us font? What is it? Why, uh, this doesn't seem... Uh, quite the whirlwind for uh, for the day before. Uh, this game shipped on Steam on... Let's look. Let's get the exact... Timeline here. Um, December 7th. A date that will live in infamy. They shipped the day before. This had become an anticipated uh, game. They launched it into early access. They were saying they they bill it as a uniquely reimagined journey into post-apocalyptic open world MMO survival set in the present day on the U.S. East Coast following a deadly pandemic. Um... It apparently was not much of an MMO at all. Apparently it was not much of an open world at all as people got their hands on it. And again, it, it, it had gotten wish listed a bunch. Like people had let themselves get very worked up about this thing. Um, and they had a, uh, a grand opening, grand closing kind of situation where they shipped the game on the seventh. Sounds like they sold about 200,000 copies. Uh, and then had about 91,000 refunds and then, uh, announced that they are shutting down the studio. And that's, and that's, and that's that, um, a lot of negative reviews of this one on steam. Let's see. There's an update that they posted on the 11th, which is Monday of the, which is yesterday, but this kind of happened over the weekend a little bit as well. Dear community, we would like to provide an update. We are sorry for the fact that the game didn't meet the expectations of the majority of the players. Today, we are working with Steam to open up refunds for any players who choose to make a refund. We'll give further updates in the nearest future. So, um, hopefully they follow through on that. The, one of the investors, the publisher of the game, uh, a company called Mitoma also 
posted something on Twitter after. So the the other upshot of this is that the studio is shutting down. Fantastic. The developers are saying, hey, it didn't do enough. We're closing our doors. Uh, Mytona says, as the investor of the day before, uh, we would like to provide some updates on the current situation around the game. We are sorry for the fact that the game didn't meet the expectations of the... Oh, this is the same. Yeah. So so this is this is the same statement uh, that is pretty much on the Steam page. But uh, today we will work with Steam to open up refunds for any players who choose to make a refund. We're in contact with Fantastic. It's Fantastic without an A in it. A. Regarding the future of the game. Uh, so they're saying that the servers will remain up probably because they signed some very expensive contract that will force them to run servers. So the, the money's probably already gone on, on the server stuff. Um, so I'm very, you know, a, a lot of people have, have kind of surrounded this situation. Be like, this is a scam. They're scamming us. And like, I don't know, the publisher is doing what they can to open up refunds. Uh, and, and all of that sort of stuff. And so, you know, it's, it's certainly possible that the developers, scammed the publisher out of that money i suppose but um but i you know i don't know it it doesn't really it doesn't necessarily need to be some kind of witch hunt i think it's very possible that a studio that had no idea what it was doing bit off way more than it can chew generated a lot of hype and then fucking fucked up um And if anything, it's probably the people who probably spent a good long time working on this fucking thing that are probably now out of work, uh, that are feeling the burn. Yeah. Pat says that the trailers had asset flips and some stolen art in them and stuff. So yeah, that's, that's not great. Um, So yeah, I, I don't I don't really know what the what, I don't think I don't know that we will know the exact uh, situation is here, but it's it's been a little weird to see like people get all pitchforky about it. It's like it's a fucking I don't know it's some generic looking fucking early access game. Like uh, I don't it's not quite the rug pull. I mean you know the the publisher is trying to stick around to give people anyone who wants a refund a refund. So. I, I, you know, people that are like, that are coming off as like legit mad about it, but have no real stake in it other than potentially trying to get a refund for the whatever amount of money this thing was, Are they're not even selling it anymore. Are they taking it off sale? I suppose that makes sense. Um, I do technically own a copy of this. I haven't had time to look at it, but, um, it is in my steam library. Um, and yeah, ideally, you know, like, like they said, the uh, over uh, somewhere close to half of the sales of the game ended up uh, already refunding the game. So if they end up giving this hundred thousand and change uh, in in refunds, there uh, they should probably do that. But I I don't you know don't get pulled in by trailers from studios that you've that don't have a reputation that you don't you, know, you just kind of look at this stuff and you're like if it seems too good to be true it might be right i mean i i don't i don't know like i, I feel like i've heard of this game before was there a trailer for it at an event maybe but like trailers are trailers they're not they're not guarantees <laughs> um they say they've worked on it for five years. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. There's a, a review here, an early access review on Steam here. It says, product received for free, product refunded. And the person just wrote a scam. I'm like, all right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, like, you got it for free and you somehow refunded it. What the fuck are you mad about? It's like, oh, this game I was anticipating turned out to be shit. That's a disappointing. That's a bummer. I'll go play something else. Done. You don't need to get this invested in 
some fucking random fucking dumb looking zombie game from people that that you're like, who the fuck are these people? Have they shipped anything else that's on Steam? Radiant One. Prop Night was the other one that they were like, oh, we don't know what this necessarily means for Prop Night going forward. Um, Which is another thing that they made. Uh, And then uh, something called Radiant One. Radiant One is art. It makes you think about the meaning of human, human existence in today's rapidly changing world. Highly recommended, says IGN. About Radiant One. I don't remember this. It came out in 2018. Hmm. Anyway. Yeah, that sucks. I don't know. That I, I hope that uh I hope that people don't get fucking Yeah, well whatever, you know, the studio shutting down. I you almost hope it's a scam because then you, you hopefully no real employees got caught out in the cold on it. And if that just ends up being some thing that the publisher and developer have to fight over to fix, okay. They should do that. They should go have legal fights about that. But you don't need to get wrapped up in that. You don't need to pick a side in the, uh, like, even though there's probably really only one side to pick. In the Mytona versus Fantastic beef, you can just go like, okay. I'm going to go, I'm going to go play something else and uh, never think about this thing again. It's just, I don't know. That, that, whatever. It, it, like, it sucks. There's a consumer aspect to it that is terrible. But like, I, the, the vitriol around it just seems weird to me. I don't know. Like, seems a little misplaced. When instead, you could be getting mad at Embracer for shutting down free radical design. I mean, if you want to get mad at something, get mad at Embracer for fucking overexpanding and buying up all this shit and then whoops, the bottom dropped out of it. That's not a scam. That's just fucking dumb. Time Splitters uh, is apparently a completely cursed property. They brought this team together yet again and tried to start a new... a new thing and, and tried to, and said, Hey, we're going to make a new time splitters, which to me seemed like a questionable idea, but I sure would have loved to have seen them try to do it and see what they would have come up with. Uh, Embracer has, uh, shut down free radical design. They had tipped their hand on this a while back because they had to say like, Hey, we're going into, uh, administration. We're going into this and that. Um, uh, and they were going into a consultation process. They have finished that process and it's, it's done. Um, some of the folks who worked there posted their thoughts on Twitter, including, uh, Adam Corrali here says the last day of free radical design was very different from what I had imagined. I don't think it's sunk in properly just yet, but handed my keys in and left the building the last time it's time to split. Yeah. So there were around 80 people there left at the end from the sound of it. Uh, according to this video games, chronicle.com story. Um, and the restructuring at Embracer continues. So that's probably not the last we'll hear from Embracer layoffs. Uh, they had Steve Ellis and, and uh, David Doak in in there who were, you know, associated with the original Time Splitters games and, and all of that sort of stuff. And It's frustrating. A QA designer said, uh, free radical design was a hub of creativity, but sadly we joined an ever growing list of casualties in a broken industry where entire studios are treated as replaceable cogs in a soulless machine fixated on nothing but share prices. Yep. Fucking sucks. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 that, that's, uh, huh. It would have been very interesting to see what they would have done with a Time Splitters game in 2024. It just seems like such an IP of its era. You're like, how do you even do that now? I mean, uh, with and and make it something that people want to play. Like, it just seems like a an uphill battle. I would have really loved to have seen it. But also, they fucking shut down a studio 
what a week and a half before Christmas. So we can, you know, like the very end of the year. Like, so like if you have to rush and find a new job, no one is hiring right now. Cause everyone's off and out of the office and everything like no one's fucking hiring right now. Anyway, like it's already the shits for anyone out there looking for work in the game business. Um, yeah. Annoying. Annoying. The Game Awards happened last week. And uh, a bunch of stuff got announced. Some awards were read aloud. I think the standout announcement is one that I am a little wary of. Or, or I guess tentatively excited about is perhaps the way I would phrase that. But Sega kind of revealed, they tipped their hand on some of the big stuff that they are working on for the years to come. They uh, had a trailer out that had a little bit of footage from five different games. Crazy Taxi, Golden Axe, Jet Set Radio, Shinobi, and Streets of Rage. Um... And that they are attempting to kind of bring those games back and, and do whatever they're going to do to them. We, we saw there have been some leaks from Jet Set in the past. So, you know, it's not unheard of. It was not like you know, 100% surprise. Um, but it was interesting to see them kind of say, hey, it's a new era. And we're, this is Sega the way that you want Sega to be. And we're, we're, we're dipping into that. There was a Washington Post interview. Um, with the CEO of Sega of America, uh, Shuji Itsumi. And uh, this article says it's a strategy that he initiated that's finally bearing fruit. Uh, and Itsumi has been, I mean, you know, he was he was there when the Dreamcast was coming out. And uh, according to this article, he was also there when Sony was launching the first PlayStation. He was at Sony, so he's he's been around a bit. We really wanted to show edginess and a rebellious mindset, he says. I don't, I don't know that that's, I don't know that any of that, uh, I don't know that that necessarily came across. It's been a long time. None of that stuff is especially edgy per se. Um, we've been investing into these, th uh, three titles. Oh, Sonic the Hedgehog. He says that Sonic the Hedgehog, Yakuza and Persona are the franchises that have been propping up the company. Um, I, this is the rise of Yakuza and Persona, the, their, as their profile rises and continues to rise, it has been really fascinating because I think those are things that you look at as like, this is a different, this is a different industry than it was 10 years ago. And of course it is, it's a dumb thing to say, but like the, when we talk about the audience's willingness to play games that like 10 or 15 years ago would have fallen by the wayside. This is precisely what I'm talking about. Uh, there was an MSNBC report on, on Sega not that long ago. And so, like, there was footage of a Persona game airing on MSNBC. And I just stopped for a minute. And I was like, what the fuck? And it's not that weird. Because of how big that franchise is and so on and so forth. But, but like... There was just, I just had this moment because you think about where those games came from and, and the Yakuza games initial forays into the United States and how fucking miserable they were. Um, it's mind blowing to me now that these games, these franchises get talked about in this context. Deservedly so. Like, I'm not like, I can't believe people are talking about these fucking like a dragon games. They're, gar you know, like, no, like they're awesome. They found ways to help make those games appeal worldwide. I think Persona 4 is really good. 1, 2, and 4 are really awesome. 3 is good, too. I mean, the, the for stuff they showed for that 3 thing, I, I really do want to see that. But um, Persona 2 and the other Persona 2. Now, those are some goddamn video games. Um, 
And so it's just fascinating that like Sega has been propped up by those and probably, you know, maybe total war to a certain extent. I wonder, maybe not as big as some of this stuff, but, um, it's fascinating. The other quote in here says the concept of, of, of this is from Mitsumi, uh, says the concept of games like jet set radio is advanced. The original creators are involved again and it's time is now it's a good time where people can appreciate all kinds of concepts. And I think that that really says it. I think I, there's probably no publisher out there that exemplifies that better than Sega right now, specifically with the success of Yakuza and Persona. I think that really, you know, as someone who's been a side, you know, like covering this stuff for a long time. And I think about where the Yakuza games fell on a priority list. It was damn near the bottom. I reviewed Persona 1 and Persona 2 back when those games were coming out um, and liked them, but they, they, you know, they felt like even within the fan base for that style of game, Persona 1 felt like an outlier to a certain extent that like, I remember the people who played it really liked it, but the, it, it wasn't really something that a ton of people, it was no Suikoden. How about that? Um, so it's really cool to see Sega doing this. Uh, the trailer showed little bits and pieces like Shinobi looks like it's still a 2D game. Uh, Streets of Rage and Golden Axe appear to be in more of a 3D environment. I also think both of those games are both both of the footage the footage of both of those games in the trailer looked pretty fucking rough. Shinobi looked cool. It had a style to it. Uh, Jet Set probably looked the most impressive. It's probably the furthest along, if I had to guess, because of how it's been leaking and, and whatever else. And Crazy Taxi, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll 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 see on 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 Crazy Taxi. It kind of looks like Crazy Taxi. And you're like, okay, I feel like if you're going to do Crazy Taxi, you probably need to do more. You probably need to do more. I don't know how, I don't know how you make a Crazy Taxi game in 2025 or whenever. Um, but you probably need to figure out, you know, they're arcade games, you know, and then. I don't know that I feel that any of those games translated super well to the home market. I guess uh, what Crazy Taxi 3 for the Xbox was kind of like their attempt to do that, right? Some people certainly like that game. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what you do to make Crazy Taxi be like a big game in the home market. Like if you made a new Crazy Taxi and said, Eugene Jarvis, put out get raw thrills, get to do a thing. Like, I could see that happening. Um, the bottom of this interview, I want to thank Gene Park for getting into this when he, when he had this interview opportunity here. Because if you don't keep hounding them about it, it'll never happen. Uh, Sega also promises to revive even more legacy properties. Fighting game fans have been wondering why the first 3D series, uh, the first 3D fighter series of Virtua Fighter is so dormant. Utsumi said the company is aware of the game's niche status. And the quote is, we are evaluating right now. Virtua Fighter doesn't use so many tricks, special moves like in Street Fighter. It's very realistic, Utsumi said. How can we make it more dramatic? It's something we're working on. Um, that's weird, right? Like you hear that and you're like, they should make a new virtual fighter. And you're like, Oh, don't, don't give these characters, uh, fireballs. <laughs> um, And yeah, calling it niche, you know, yeah, I mean, it is, it is, it is. When it comes out worldwide, it is. Virtua Fighter has always, had always kind of been that, right? 
I think if they had cultivated it better and treated it a little bit better worldwide, they probably could have had some Tekken like success. Um, but Tekken had that success and I think Tekken has that success for a reason because it's a very approachable and fucking awesome video game <laughs> full of crazy characters, uh, approachable moves. It can be very mashy when it needs to be for people that need that. And, and all of that Virtua fighter is you can mash it out. But it's an art, man, especially in Japan, you know, when they're devoting entire floors of arcades to Virtua Fighter 4 and 5 cabinets, depending on when you're there. Um, it's a weird thing. Virtua Fighter 5 is an incredible fighting game, but it's a fighting game for fighting game fans. And you see Sega trying to swing bigger with this stuff. This isn't them trying to like meet the small pockets of players where they are. This is them saying like, we are going to make some big fucking video games because persona and Yakuza have gotten big. We need to get some other stuff big. And so let's bring back this stuff that people keep saying they want and, uh, and see what happens. Um, at different scopes. I mean, Shinobi I'm sure is, is taking place at a different scale and scope than, than all of those other games. Right. But like, what do you do to Virtua Fighter if, you're, if your goal is to make all of these games more mainstream? You can't necessarily just put an easy control mode in there because you don't have special moves and stuff like that that you need to be able to do at the push of a button. You could, you could add in a, uh, an easy auto combo. You could add in some of that stuff. But, like, how do you... How do you make that game work for more people without losing the soul of what makes Virtua Fighter Virtua Fighter. And the answer is you don't put out a new Virtua Fighter. You put out Sonic the Fighters 2. The end. Problem solved. <laughs> um... Yeah, it's it's a it's it's a weird one. So, but like, even if it had, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's I I don't know that VF five thing that they just put out recently. You know, recently, in the last couple of years here when they re released it. Um, it was great. It was great to have that back. It was great to to have like here's a here's a take on this thing and um, and it felt like a real labor of love and it kind of came out. It was like a PlayStation Plus game the the month it came out. So it was like. There were people playing it there for a little while too. And that was kind of exciting. I wonder if people are still playing that. I should, I didn't, I ended up not playing a ton of it, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, Virtual Fighter five is a great game. I think that I, I, I don't know what you do with a VF six or if you reboot Virtual Fighter, which is an even weirder concept. Um, like, what do you, what do you actually do? Because if you just put out like, hey, here's, here's the sequel to Virtua Fighter 5, like that's great. Uh, that could be an amazing fighting game. But in terms of appeal, it's not going to break out of the kind of fighting game fan box that it's already in. Um, it's not going to do Street Fighter numbers. It's not going to do Mortal Kombat numbers. It's, you know, it's just not going to sell like that. So what do you do to try to help that game break out? Like how do you... Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know that there's an actual good answer to that question. Other than making a sequel to Sonic the Fighters, because then you can say everyone loves Sonic, that fucking guy. Look at him. Now he's in a fighting game. Did you ever play the first one? Of course you didn't. Now's your chance. You play the fucking alligator in this one, man. Fuck it. Um, in terms of other announcements, uh, I'll turn to Polygon, one of the best in the game when it comes to putting all the announcements from an event on a single page, polygon.com. Pony Island 2 was announced, uh, follow up to Thumper called Thrasher, 
Uh, the next game from the studio behind Dead Cells called Windblown, which is kind of an isometric kind of look. It reminded me of Bastion at the time, just ever so slightly. Uh, a sequel to World of Goo. They're going to make World of Goo 2, which is crazy. Uh, there's some free uh, God of War Ragnarok DLC. That's out today, in fact. Um, it's kind of a combat arena rogue like kind of thing from the, the description. Um, let's see. Visions of Mana was announced a new, new game in that franchise. Kojima came out and announced OD, the game that had leaked as the, under the name overdose. And that is seemingly a horror-themed game um, that will come to Xbox. It is the, the, the long-awaited Kojima Xbox game that everyone has been talking about for a long time and increasing levels of specificity as, as this OD stuff leaked out. They brought out Jordan Peele to talk uh, as well because he is apparently collaborating on the project in some way. Udo Kier is in it. So you know it's going to be creepy. Um, and despite being on stage for something like eight or nine minutes, or what felt like a very long time, not a lot of detail given. Not a lot of detail given in uh, what was probably the largest chunk uh, on the entire show. Oh, wow, gosh, what else? I'm skipping over a lot of stuff. They played the theme song to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Kind of a cool moment. Um, Arcane Leon is making a Blade game. Like like Wesley Snipes. I mean, probably not Wesley Snipes. But, uh, but Blade the Daywalker, the vampire. They're, they're going to make a game based on Blade. It's been a long time since there's been a Blade game. Arcane Leon. And Blade seems like it could be kind of cool. The trailer was uh, fun for what it was. Not super, not super detailed. Uh, it's a yeah, it's a third person. It's a third person game. They didn't. They did say that. Um, they did not say if any motherfuckers will attempt to uh, ice skate uphill. I would love to see them get Wesley Snipes for this. Is it is that bad? Is it like I, I can only envision Blade in one way. I know he's a character who has existed for a good long time, and it doesn't have to be Wesley Snipes. But also, what if it was Wesley Snipes? That'd be cool. Um, Ten Chambers, the studio behind GTFO, announced that GTFO is getting its kind of like final update after a good number of years of, of updates. They also announced their next game called Den of Wolves, which is like a sci-fi heist game. Uh, remember that some of those folks there are uh, Payday 2 veterans. And you see a little bit of that in some of the GTFO stuff. I hope that Den of Wolves, whatever it ends up being is more approachable to a larger audience than GTFO was. GTFO was very deliberately fucked in a way that if you were not on your shit, you were dead. And uh, that was fun once or twice. And, uh, <laughs> and then that was that. Uh, you either love that game or you don't have the patience to walk through it with a bunch of other players, or maybe you're the one who's fucking up and you're the people have patience for you. Um, Den of Wolves, I, you know, very kind of cyberpunk sci-fi kind of vibe to it, but it sounds like it'll be a similar type of heist game. I think Ulf said, uh, that the, uh, there maybe it was another interview quote or it was part of the press release or something, but there was, there was something out there where they're basically saying like, yeah, it's, you know, when you get away from just like, the real world of like bank robberies and those styles of heists, it opens up a, a, you know, a lot of variance and a lot of variety that it was maybe hard to do in a more grounded game. So that sounds intriguing. 
uh, for for Den of Wolves. Nice look to the trailer too, I'll say. Uh, the finals came out. They showed a trailer and said it's out now. I installed it and ran through the t- tutorial, and then I was like, yeah, I don't know if I want to play around with this right now, and have not have not made it back to it. Uh, Hello Games. Sean Murray came out on stage to announce the next game from the developers behind No Man's Sky. It is called Light No Fire. And um, it is planet-based type of genitative, genitative content and, and so on. Whereas No Man's Sky was attempting to do a universe... This is attempting to do to a planet in a way that in theory should lead to a much more variety on that planet than you got in the planets in No Man's Sky, which is a weird comparison point. But, um, but all of that sounds like they've been working on it for something like five years. Uh, and, um, we'll see. I don't know. Uh, he, he, he said this. The, the quote that Polygon pulled here, it's the first real open world, something without boundaries, which is, yeah, okay. I, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, interesting looking trailer, interesting looking concept. I think, you know, that, that sounds, I, I think that the 10 years of No Man's Sky has probably left them in a place where they know if this is attainable or not, and they probably also expect to be working on it for another decade or so. Um... Or some number of years, maybe not a full decade, but you know, uh, with with No Man's Sky, they had to spend a lot of time digging themselves out of a hole. And so, with Light No Fire, if they don't create that hole in the first place, they'll probably be in a better place supporting it going forward. And uh, and whatever else, small team working on it. Are they over promising? Who can say? I will say, uh, you know, hey, like I was saying about that other game, these trailers are just trailers. You got to kind of wait and see. Um, but intriguing concept that I, I will say, I, I think it seems attainable considering the journey that they have been on for the past 10 years. This, this seems like something that would be uh, attainable for them to pull off. And then I bet if this doesn't kill them, <laughs> making these two games back to back once they've gotten it down on how to generate one really densely populated and interesting and fascinating planet. You then take that technology back into space and you populate a universe with those planets and you make a no man's sky too. In uh, let's call it 2034. Maybe we, maybe we see that 2034, 2035, something like that. And one of those planets, if you can find it, will contain Joe Danger 3. Then, and only then, will we, will we be permitted to play the follow-up to Joe Danger. Um... Monster Hunter Wilds was revealed out in 2025. Looks pretty open. Looked pretty good, but also looked like Monster Hunter. And so balancing that out. uh, And then Baldur's Gate 3 is out on Xbox, which they didn't really say during the show. They kind of had a weird... They had a lot of moments for Baldur's Gate 3 during that show, but at no point in them did they seem to say, out now on Xbox. It just kind of launched... And that was a little weird. Um, there were also awards there, which I know is a, a quaint concept to have awards at the Game Awards. Um, I I think they I think in terms of who won what, in a general sense, I think that the big awards went in the right directions. Um, Baldur's Gate 3 really kind of ran the table uh, and and won a lot of stuff and that was really exciting to see even, even to someone who's not like a big fan of the game uh, it was it was really 
interesting to see it go in that direction. Alan Wake 2 did quite well winning, what, best game direction, best narrative, best art direction. Um, but Baldur's Gate won for best performance. It won overall game of the year. Uh, I guess actually, oh, it won best community support, which I guess makes sense considering they've been early access for a while and, and all of that. Um, it won best RPG, of course. Uh, that was the only category that Starfield was nominated in was best RPG. Uh, which ha I, I feel like has to be seen as something of a disappointment. I'm, I'm sure that they can fall back on whatever their engagement numbers and game, you know, however many subscriptions to game pass it sold and, and whatever else. But, um, you know, for a game that was billed as the most important, this and that, and the, the first next generation, um, so on and so forth. Um, I, I, I feel like the reception to that game has to be, has to be considered a disappointment at this point, regardless of the, the, the numbers. I think the, you know, you have mod makers out there, like the, the mod maker who worked on the multiplayer mod for Skyrim was starting to work on it for Starfield. And then there were quotes from, from that person who they just, they just dumped their source code and said, I'm done with it. Uh, you'll have to take a, a, you know, it's not done. The the mod is not done, but, but that person was just like, this game sucks. I don't want to work on mods for it because it's not a good game. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, there are certainly things about Starfield that I like. Uh, there are aspects of it that I thought uh, were pretty cool. Um, my personal uh, opinion of that game turned quite sour the more I played it. It was a case like in the first 15 hours, you saw all the possibility. And then in the last five hours, you saw how few of those possibilities they cashed in on. And it quickly became just like, well, fly over here and get this power. Fly around this room and get this. Now do this. Now do this. And you're like, this is neat, but there's not an, I don't, there's like not a lot of variety to this gameplay here. Like the whole middle point of the main quest is just fly to the same weird room on different planets over and over again. Um, it's, it's a, it's a bizarre game. I don't know. Like, well, I'd be curious to see what that game looks like in five years. If they do anything meaningful to it, or if they're just moving on. And they'll put out the stuff they need to put out for it. They'll put out their mod tools. They'll put out their DLC. And will they eventually just be like, all right, here's the next Elder Scrolls. And uh, just try to move forward. I, I, it's a weird. Again, I, I think there's probably things, you know, from a numbers perspective, from a metrics perspective, I'm sure that there are aspects of that game that they are probably still celebrating internally one way or the other. Uh, at least how they did it launch and, and whatever else, like as far as, as far as game pass goes. Um, but again, they have to internally, they have to be like, shit, like what do we, you know, like the reviews on steam are mixed and Bethesda customer support is spending their time responding to reviews, trying to get people to see it their way uh and i i don't know you know in terms of expectations versus delivery yeah in in terms of expectations versus where the game was at when it came out it has to be it's a bigger gulf than redfall ever was and Redfall became this like three alarm fire apology tour thing of like, oh boy, we got to, uh, <laughs> um, like, it, you know, it's, it's like, that has to be a bigger gulf. I wonder where, if, if, how much they were prepared for it on, in terms of mock reviews or, or whatever else, like if they internally were starting to feel it and go like, okay, we, 
we're starting to think that this game is not going to come in with the same types of scores that Skyrim potentially enjoyed um, or, or, or whatever, right? Um, Street Fighter 6 wins best fighting game. Super Mario Wonder wins best family game, which I don't, I don't think I agree with because I, you know, as someone with a family, uh, that game was more frustrating than fun. Um, but that's, you know, my, my kids are young, so, uh, so maybe if you have teens or pre or tweens, maybe it's a great family game. I don't know, but that, the, the multiplayer in that game just doesn't seem like well realized to begin with. So I, I think that's kind of a, just a weird one um, across the board. Um, probably the award that probably sticks out the most um, for like, wait, what? is best ongoing game, which is, uh, the description is awarded to a game for outstanding development of ongoing content that evolves the player experience over time. The winner there was Cyberpunk 2077, which I think is, um, I think that's a, I think that's a travesty. I, I think, and, you know, like, I, I will set aside I don't, I don't think that's from a qualitative, like, what do you think about cyberpunk type of thing? They, that game got pulled out of stores. That game game got pulled off of the PlayStation store for how messed up it was at launch. And then they spent a bunch of time patching it and trying to get it to a place where it more closely resembled the game that they promised. In a different scenario, if a different developer was at the controls, we would be having a conversation similar to the day before conversation about cyberpunk. Um, they put out DLC. They fixed the game, which included some overhauls of some of the systems and character, you know, like character progression stuff. And then they sold the DLC that they said that they were going to put out and sell. Um, that to me is not an ongoing game. That's an ongoing fire that you were attempting to put out. And so the idea that it won, I think really washes away like it, 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 it feels like an attempt or, or, or it ignores the hole that that game was in when it launched. It ignores, uh, all of those situations. And I, I think, you know, I, mm, yeah, I, I don't know. I, 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 I look at that as the people doing the voting need to think about it a little more. Uh, then apparently they did because I, I think that's a really crazy. I think that's a really crazy short sighted choice. Um, the other nominees in the category Apex Legends, Final Fantasy 14, Fortnite, and Genshin Impact. Of those, I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know that I would, I, I you know, No Man's Sky. I, the No Man's Sky is a game that went beyond, right? Like, People try to make that comparison of just like, oh, cyberpunk. They had a real No Man's Sky like category, like like uh, trajectory there. Like, yeah, but then they stopped. Like they got the game where it needed to be. They put out their DLC. People seemed to like the DLC, and then they said, "All right, cool. Well, we're going to go work on our next game now." Hello Games spent a decade working on no man's sky. They have been, they, they, it's, that's ridiculous. That's a best ongoing game is they fixed their problems years ago and have been overcorrecting on the, uh, in, in ways of just like, here's some, I don't know. Now it's VR. Now we're putting it out here. We're, uh, man, we're adding base. We're adding all this other stuff now. Like that game's ridiculous. And they didn't charge for any of it. Uh,
so I, I don't know. I, I, I think that uh, the, the cyberpunk, just choosing cyberpunk for this is just straight up wrong. Um, because the, the situation was such completely, so completely different. Like, they, hey, they patched their game. Go, oh, cool. It now more closely resembles some of the trailer stuff and some of the stuff they talked about with, you know, cops and police response and so on and so forth. Like, oh, how many years did it take him to get there? Oh, that's, mm, oh, hmm. Well, Idris Elba's in it, so that's exciting. It's just, it's crazy. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Best ongoing game. I, I tend to think No Man's Sky is, you know, until they stop is probably something that ends up in there. And uh, I might say, gosh, No Man's Sky is not a nominee in the category, by the way. Like if the Fortnite stuff had happened before all of this, if the if the Fortnite expansion had happened uh, before the Game Awards nominees cut off and, and whatever else, maybe that would be something. Uh, Terraria, yeah, ter I mean, are the Terraria updates still major? Like someone in chat mentioned Terraria, and and, and I was thinking of Terraria when we were talking about beds in LEGO Fortnite because it's a similar, a similar idea. Um, yeah, was the Minecraft update substantial this year? Like, that's the question. I don't know that I have the, the answer to that question. Um, so it's just a, you know, I, I think that's a meaningful category because I think like talking about games that are still doing it and still doing great at it um, is viable and worth talking about and worth discussing. But also I think it's really hard to get everyone around to, you know, play some of those games. Like, you know, there are, yeah, the Terraria is a, a great example of like, or Stardew Valley, I guess, right? And those are still, you know, there's still meaningful Stardew Valley updates. I don't know. I don't actually know the answer to that question. Nanopus asks, is it wrong to doubt that the game awards voting is as democratic as they make it seem? Um, I don't, I don't find any of these choices hard to believe in a, like someone put a thumb on the scale kind of way. Like I, I don't, I would never suggest that there's anything, any kind of impropriety happening. I think it's more that like people fill out some of these ballots and probably should think a little more about it um, because the process is easy. Like the judges submit nominees, you fill out a form and you have to come up with a minimum of three for a category for any of your nominees to count. Uh, but you can nominate as many as five. I often nominate fewer than five. Like I think for game of the year, I wrote in four games because I was like, these are the four that deserve it. And I don't want to water that down by nominating a fifth game. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if you, that, that means if you can only think of one game in the fighting game category, your things are not going to count. And they say like, Hey, if there are categories that you're not familiar with, you do not need to place a vote. Like when, when it comes, when, so, so basically that's how the nominees are done. Then the nominees come out, we get back a list of what the nominees are and we pick one single winner per category in the categories that we're voting on. Cause like I didn't vote on any of the esports categories. I think there's a separate panel for that. Um, and then sometimes there are sponsored or fan voted categories or whatever that, that we don't really touch either. Um, and so <clears throat> I think that those are pretty good guardrails in place in theory. Like, oh, if you can't name three games that belong here, then, then don't, then don't, you should just leave it blank. And if, and they say explicitly like, Hey, if you, uh, it, it, you know, when the nominees come out, if you don't know anything about VR games, for example, but it applies to any category, if you don't feel comfortable voting in a category, don't vote. Um, and so I think from their side of things, I think they're doing mostly what they can. Um, so anyway, I, I guess like that's, that's my way of saying, I, I don't think that there's any world in which that these awards are like faked or, or whatever. I don't think there's a need to do it. I think that the, like these, these lists seem very viable to me, including the mistakes. Like it's very easy for me to see why Dave the Diver would end up on best indie game. Because if you had a conversation about it and really thought about it, you'd be like, oh, yeah, no, there, there's no way Dave the Diver is an indie game. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't meet the spirit of what we're going for here. 
And so we shouldn't allow it in this category. But enough judges wrote it in because they didn't know that that studio is owned by Nexon or whatever. And it certainly looks like an indie game. It's very easy to, like, if you didn't know, like, if I didn't know that until, you know, like, I think someone said it in chat, like, you know, I, I even, I might not have even looked it up, potentially. So I, I think that there's a lot of, um, it's, it's easy to understand how that mistake happens. And so I would look at that and, you know, if, if, if I were looking at a, like a list of things to try to, um, manage next year, if I were the game awards, it would be trying to figure out like how much, how, how much of a say, like how, how much of a veto power, how much of a, like what, what is the what is the level of control we should have over determining uh, what game in this again, you know, not to have the genre conversation over again, but like, Hey, you know, what do you, what do you do to make sure that like the indie games are actually indie games to just prevent this conversation from coming up again, if nothing else. Um, Dave, the diver didn't win. So whatever, see if stars won. And that seems like a perfectly valid choice. It's no pizza tower. But, uh, but what are you going to do? Yeah. Is, is Larian an independent company? Shouldn't Baldur's Gate have won best indie game? Probably, but that's because best indie game means something else, right? But their description, the Game Awards description of it is for outstanding creative and technical achievement in a game made outside the traditional publisher system. And so you know, the what is indie conversation has plagued every fucking medium, movies, music, all that stuff. Like it, it's, it's a dumb, it's dumb. <laughs> um, but you need something like it. And what do you call it? What do you actually call it to try to narrow, you know, what do you call that category in order to shave off Dave, the diver to make sure that, but also you probably don't want Baldur's Gate 3 in there either because if you start taking big budget indie and throwing it in there, it fucks this category up in different ways. And then Sea of Stars ends up getting jack shit. And that's not what you want. You want games like that to be able to be honored. You want a game like Viewfinder to end up on a nominees list even if it doesn't deserve to win. You want Pizza Tower to end up somewhere. And so how do you... How do you thread that needle? I don't think there, I think you just have to like draw the lines and say, fuck it. And these are the lines they drew. The judges make the determination. And that's that. Uh, I think that there's probably more to be done there that would just, you know, th that makes it a, a better, a cleaner. You don't want these conversations bogging down the discussion around your awards show. It's just not worth it. You know, um, it's not that big of a deal at the end of the day, but. You know, um, and so the, the best indie game, the best ongoing game, I, I think those are ones that I'd look at and go like, ah, yeah, yeah, there's some stuff there. Also, the idea that Street Fighter Six didn't get nominated for overall game of the year is a fucking tragedy. And for the number of times that I've typed out the words El Paso elsewhere, boy, it sure didn't make it through the other side. Oh. Um, which tells me that more people need to play El Paso elsewhere. So you should play El Paso elsewhere. If you haven't allow me to remind you that that game is good. It has a great voice performance. It has an amazing soundtrack. Uh, it is a hell of an action game. Anyway. Uh, and people are saying Street Fighter 6 belonged in accessibility. Uh, it, it did get nominated. Uh, the, the accessibility stuff in Forza is really nuts. It's like super over the top. Like, I, I, I think Forza Motorsport is a game with significant issues. And it sounds like I'm not alone in that. Uh, which is interesting because I, I, I wasn't sure when I was playing it pre-release. I was like, are people going to love this game and then think I'm an asshole? Is it, is it one of those? Am I going to be... 
Or am I going to be some weird outlier here? And then it was like, oh no, like this game has significant issues and, and, and it's not just me. Um, especially on PC, which is mostly where I played it. And I was like, oh, this seems like it runs like shit. Um, anyway, but the accessibility side of Forza is incredible. Like when you go, go look at, you know, I'm sure that they put out some stuff about it. Like, you know, even if you don't go dig into the menus yourself, like if you watch them run through it, it's fascinating. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, it's, it's way more than like, Hey man, you can push a button to do a fireball. But street fighter has some of the, like, you know, it'll, it has some audio cue stuff as well. Like there's, there's more to it than just that too. So the, the, like street fighter six is cool on that front. Uh, but Forza is nuts. Um, they, they went really far on that. It's, it's impressive. Uh, so I think that's a, that's an easy win there. Um, other stuff from the show, uh, the big criticism is that uh, people did not get enough time to talk. Uh, I agree. Developers, the, the winners of these awards did not get enough time to talk. You had a lot of awards that were just kind of given out in bunches, uh, read by whether it was uh, Jeff Keighley or, or Sidney uh, Goodman, which is kind of just knocked through some awards. Um. And then, you know, for the big awards where people did come up to the stage, they had, you know, like 30 seconds or something like that uh, before music started. Like they got played off by music, which is like a really corny, like it's a funny joke, right? It's, it's, you know, um, but it's, it's a bummer. Um, but also, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, the... This is them overcorrecting from the speech from last year, which I, I remember sitting, I sat, I went to the game awards in person last year. I, uh, and I sat down and then the first award was, uh, Christopher judge's speech that he came out and, and talked about, he was the Mr. T of that show, uh, like, uh, Mr. T and going into WWE hall of fame levels of. He's just, he's just going to keep going. He's, he's just going to keep talking. He's really, he's just going to keep going, huh? Um, and not long after that, I was like, I got to get up. I got to go to the bathroom. And, uh, I ended up not staying for the full show, but I, I had, I had to get home and handle some kids. Some, some stuff happened and I had to leave, but. But it definitely like set the tone of just like, shit, man, I don't want to like, this is too much. Um, and so I get why you overcorrect. I get why you think uh, when you're planning it out, you go like, okay, we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. We need to make sure that there's a, uh, a, a like, we need to make sure that the, these speeches don't go on so long. And, uh, and here's what we're going to do. And they overcorrect it. And, um, it sucks. It, it sucks that, uh, more people weren't able to speak, uh, at length, but also uh, the thing I'll say is that awards acceptance speeches are usually not amazing. <laughs> you know, like that's the problem, right? I think a lot of the conversations around, uh, awards shows in general. And I think a lot of the criticism that the game awards gets specifically are inherent to awards shows. Um, but I do think you need to do better than 30 seconds. And I think that they, they do need to, to have a, a more. And, uh, you know, they need to provide developers, uh, the, the people accepting these awards, a place to talk. And, um, and a place to do something. And I, th I think that that, that matters. Um, so, but, but in terms of like the flow of the show and, and all of that, it felt a little long. And so having longer acceptance speeches might not have been the right answer, but also it's, it's the right thing to do. Um, cut two minutes off the fucking Kojima segment. I don't know. Like that probably ran long to be honest. Uh, and there, I bet in there, if, if you look at their run sheets, I bet that that Kojima segment probably wasn't originally booked to be that long, but 
but who knows? Who knows? Like, whatever. At the end of the day, I, that stuff shouldn't matter. I think it does matter because if your show is longer, that's security that you're paying for an extra hour. That's, you know, there's a lot of hard costs in the building itself. Like, it's easy to think like, oh, well, you're doing a three hour show, do a four hour show. It's the internet. It's not television. Go as long as you need to go. But at some point, I'm sure there's a lot of weird costs around keeping that building staffed and running and, and whatever else. So may, maybe that's something that matters. Maybe that's something they're concerned about, but, but I don't know. Uh, I thought overall it was, the show was fine. It was a little long. Um, and, uh, speaking of Christopher judge, he got himself in a little bit of trouble, I guess. Uh, he did get out there. So he got, he was like the first person out there to then like announce for the first award. Um, and I'm looking if Eurogamer has the exact quote, but basically, uh, he said that his acceptance speech from 2022 was longer than this year's modern warfare campaign. Uh, which in the moment was like a funny little bit. And, pe and some people were like, Ooh, Ooh, you know, it was like just a little bit of like, Ooh, it was like that type of joke where people were like, Oh, that's real. But also, I mean, it's not, it's not the camp. It's not technically real, but like, um, it's, it's a, uh, you know, so then you had some developers on Twitter being like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> like, why are, you know, like we just spent a bunch of time trying to get that fucking game out and we're taking shots from a voice actor at the game award. They didn't go on in on him for being a voice actor, but, it, but there was an element of just like, we're not used to hearing our peers give us shit. Like we get a lot of shit from the users, but you would at least think the industry would not shit on us. Uh, and, and so that was kind of the tone of some of the social media stuff from current and former call of duty developers was a lot of like, Hey, I thought we were all in the trenches on this shit and we don't talk shit about each other publicly. Uh, what the fuck? Um, which generally speaking, I think is good advice. I think people that are working on games probably shouldn't spend a bunch of time talking shit about other games. It's fucking bad form. It's uh, also, I think, from a career perspective, maybe not great, but also he's a voice actor. So he's, you know, he's not, it's not like he works at Sony Santa Monica. It's not like it was like the producer of God of War coming out there and saying it. That would have been way crazier. That would have been fucking nuts. Also, yeah, did, who, did someone write that? Yeah, did he write that joke? And someone, like, yeah, you know, it, it probably went through a few approval levels and, and, and whatever else. Maybe Activision will buy more ad time next year and they'll, they won't, they won't catch strays like this. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like that's some people then had to go and, and delete some of the things they wrote because they started getting death threats over it because the, because Twitter is a fucking cesspool. Um, But yeah, the, the, the X infinity ward, uh, staffer who posted something basically saying like, well, I mean, we, we've done more numbers and more sales and more anything than all of the God of war games combined. So, <laughs> you know, uh, which then that didn't help. That didn't help. But, uh, yeah, I don't know as it's, uh, it's, it's a. I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I would have like if, if, if the jokes were getting approved or anything like that, that might have been one I looked at and said, like, let's not simply because. I, you know, there's room for that in an award show, but I think if you're looking at the stated goal of the game awards. Um, if we're looking at the stated goal of the game awards, which, you know, Jeff Keeley gets out at the top of every one of these and talks all about like celebrating the year in gaming and all of the celebrating the positive, you know, 
like all of that sort of stuff to then have like literally the first person you walk out on stage be like, Hey, call of duty, eat, eat a dick. <laughs> um, maybe it's a little rough. I don't know, but also, uh, you know, I, I, if we lived in a world where social media and like, if, if, if we lived in a world where the video game industry was not also permeated with fucking children issuing death threats all the time and acting like total fucking lunatics, uh, stuff like that would be a lot easier to take, but because it, you know, I think especially if you're probably a call of duty dev right now, you've probably just been like eating shit online for months now, if not years. And you're just like, ugh, great. Yeah, here's here's one more like a, um. So yeah, in that in that in that specific way, I'd say it it, it just seemed a little out of place and um and whatever else. So I I don't know. Yeah, was was that joke on the teleprompter? Or was it not? I I I don't know. Um. But other than that, I think it was one of the better editions of the Game Awards. You know, they're 10 years in every year. They correct on something every year. There's always something that you come away from it going like, eh, it should be more like this. I, I don't know that they'll ever quite nail it. There'll always be something. Um, but I think in so far as like the way the game awards kind of always is this, you know, and it's not necessarily going to change that mission and change that structure too dramatically. I think for its format, I think they did really well. Um, and I feel better about the awards and winners uh, with the exceptions of what we spoke about earlier uh, than, than I have in previous years. So I think it's, it's a nice, credible list um, on, on top of everything else. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. We got one more news story. Man, turned out to be a lot of news today. This is a huge story. I don't know that I am like in a position to parse it uh, completely, but Epic won in court against Google. Uh, the ruling from the court, uh, this is stemming from the all the Fortnite on phones stuff. If you remember, Apple won a piece of its lawsuit with Epic and it didn't go down this way, but for Google, it went down the other way. And uh, a jury has decided that Google has an illegal monopoly on uh, on Android app stores and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, this is according to The Verge. The Verge has had really good blow-by-blow -blow reporting of this stuff. They sent someone to the court and sat in there and, and kind of live blogged it, which was, which was fun. Um, And, uh, but yes, the, the ruling is that Google has monopoly power in the Android app distribution market and in in-app billing services markets. And I think the reason that they probably ended up going this way is because Google also did a lot of anti-competitive things in that market. You, the, the, a lot of the evidence and a lot of the, uh, the stuff revealed over the course of this trial in terms of how Google has run that business uh, has been a lot around them making highly specific deals and basically paying people to not launch their own app store with riot. They did this Spotify has been given incredibly favorable terms, uh, in terms of the amount of money that they pay to Google. Um, but also like there are situations where they deliberately, they like they thought of Epic as being, uh, a thorn in their side in, in this sort of market. And they hoped that they could kind of stave it off and whatever else by doing a deal with them. But it sounds like they did a deal with riot and another deal with Activision to say like, Hey, we'll give you favorable terms and marketing and whatever else, uh, is just don't go and launch your own app store or your own thing outside of our app store because everyone, you know, like everyone wants to do that. And Android makes it possible. Like it's the thing. It's already possible on Android to launch your own thing. Um, But the hoops you have to jump through to make it happen are still a little funky. So I don't know what the remedy is here. It's, it's you know, Epic has kind of said like, hey, we're, we're not really, we're not necessarily looking for money out of this. We just want it to change. Um, 
Epic did not sue for damages. Uh, but Tim Sweeney did suggest, according to The Verge, that Epic stood to make hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars if it doesn't have to pay Google's fee. Um, so yeah, we don't know what, what will happen on the other end of this. Uh, it wants, uh, Epic wants the court to tell Google, I'm just reading from this Verge article here, to tell Google that every app developer has total freedom to introduce its own app stores and its own billing systems on Android. And we don't yet know how or even whether the judge might grant those wishes. So that's the thing. I mean, with Android being the open platform that it is, you can do that. Now, you have always been able to do that. But sideloading is a thing where, you know, they always kind of put a little thing in there and say, hey, this is risky. This is that. So it's probably a certain amount of like making sure that those app stores get installed in ways that don't demean them by referring to them as, as might be malware. Uh, this, this application is not Google Play Store protect, protected or whatever. Um, I, I, but I don't like that stuff always felt like inherent to the OS and, and not necessarily something that's part of, I mean, it, it is a blockade for people that want to set up their own app store or whatever else, but considering it also blocks and also prevents, you know, it also makes it a little bit more difficult for the average user to install bad shit. Um, that's probably better. I don't know. Maybe that, you know, will Google need to make sure that third party app stores have kind of first class service and they can update apps and they can do all the things that, that the Google play store can do. Will that have to be something that they, I, I don't know how they fix this. Like, I don't know. Cause, cause again, there's nothing preventing you from launching your own separate app store or running your own payments and, and stuff on Android today. It just means you can't do it as part of the Google play store. So I'm, I'm not sure what they're asking for. That doesn't also involve like technically making Android a little less safe along the way. Um, for, and when I say safe, I mean, for people who don't know any better, there are, you know, plenty of people who are computer savvy enough that know that like, Hey, I downloaded this APK from Epic's site. It's probably all good. I, I, I trust the place I acquired this from. I didn't just go download it from some forum. I'm not downloading fucking hacked fucking Spotify that removes all the ads. I'm not downloading fucking YouTube revanced from some fucking mega link. And it's full of all kinds of weird shit. That's going to steal my contacts and steal, you know, or whatever. Uh, if you download it from riot and it's the thing that installs riot games and whatever, it's probably okay. It's yeah, exactly. It's not fucking hot free V bucks dot APK. It's not radical porn dot APK. Um, but maybe it's a situation where everyone wants the Spotify deal of like, Oh, we want to be in your store, but we don't want to pay you anything just like Spotify. I don't know. I, so yeah, we'll see. I mean, Google obviously is going to appeal. They gave a statement to the verge. Um, we plan to challenge the verdict. Android and Google Play provide more choice and openness than any other major mobile platform. The trial made clear that we compete fiercely with Apple and its App Store, as well as app stores on Android devices and gaming consoles. We will continue to defend the Android business model and remain deeply committed to our users, partners, and the broader Android ecosystem. Um... Yeah, Google kept kept trying to make this about Apple, and then the the case itself sounded like it, it kept getting steered back towards apps and app stores, specifically on Android. It's not about like we don't. It was basically like we don't give a shit what Apple's doing. That's a whole different thing. What's happening here in this lane, and all the emails that you have sent internally complaining about other app stores and bragging that you got a uh, riot to not make their own app store by giving them a bunch of money instead. Uh, those are things that a court looks at and goes, oh, you're deliberately out there trying to, to, you know, prevent people from competing with your app store in whatever way you possibly can. Because once one goes and once people, once users get used to the experience of having to install a separate storefront for a Fortnite or for 
uh, whatever League of Legends auto chess or whatever the fuck Riot has on mobile. Um, once they get used to that process, they'll be willing to do it more and more. Especially when games start to incentivize it and be like, hey, download it, download it directly from us instead of from Google and we'll give you a hot skin. We'll hook you, we'll skin you up, dog. We'll skin up together. We will twist one and blaze. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, Google's defense on this is like that they defend the 30% they take off the app store sales as being something that helps them justify the like billions of dollars that they put into building Android in the first place. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, there's nothing stopping. Did they, is, can you play Fortnite on Android phones like now? Did they always have their, have they always had their own thing? Did they release it? Because they, they did have that at one point. I don't know if they went ahead and stuck with it or if they or if they pulled that down. Yeah, you can't. You can't. So like, what? I, I don't. I'm just not 100% sure what they're asking for. Like what Epic wants to change. That has not been made clear in any of the stuff that I've read so far. I mean, other than this vague kind of like. Um, let's, let's read what Epic put on their company blog about it see if they have anything to say epic v google trial verdict a win for all developers today's verdict is a win for all app developers and consumers around the world it proves that google's app store practices are illegal and they abuse their monopoly to extract exorbitant fees stifle competition and reduce innovation these deals were meant to cement dominance, blah, 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 30% tax, so on and so forth. From the CEO down, Google employees willfully redirected sensitive conversations to chat, knowing that their contents would be deleted forever. Yeah, there's an aspect of this where, like, some stuff. Thank you to the court for hearing this important case and for the next steps determining the remedies that will right Google's decades of anti-competitive conduct. And thank you to the jury for their historic decision. The one million game developers who couldn't be here, thank you. Like, no name on this at all. Just write Tim Sweeney at the bottom. At this point. Um, so I don't, I don't really, again, uh, they, they don't suggest what those remedies should be here or what's going to come out the other end of it. And I, I don't know. I don't know what this ends up being. Or, or what ed, what ends up changing? Um, it, well, I'm going to read this sentence again here. Epic wants the court to tell Google that every app developer has total freedom to introduce its own app stores and its own billing systems on Android, and we don't yet know how or even whether the judge might grant those wishes. Both parties will meet with the judge in the second week of January to discuss potential remedies. I, you can already do that on an Android phone. Again, like there, there are hurdles in place, but those hurdles to me strike me as like safety related to prevent like your mom from installing malware. Do they want these stores to, do they want Google to have to list these stores in their store? Is that it? Do they want to say, oh, well, we want to we want to put the Epic store in the Google store and we want to pay you 0% for it. Is that it? Does Epic want my mom to get malware? My mom doesn't have an Android phone. Come on. Um... So yeah, I, I don't, I, we'll see what that ends up, what shape that ends up taking. I, I don't really know. Again, as someone who, you know, where is my, as someone who has an Android device right here, uh, that I, I, it's my burner phone that I use for playing Amico games. Uh, no, uh, I, I don't really know what the, I, I, yeah, I, I'm not really sure what the, what the situation is with that. Anyway, 
we'll see what form that takes. Uh, maybe we'll have a better idea in a month or so, second week of January. We'll see what they get in court and say about what they want. Because I, again, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, that's going to just about do it for the show. Maybe we can take one, I'm going to squeeze in one email here. Podcast at guard.bike is the email address. Send in your emails to me and I will read them. Uh, Grant writes in and says, will history remember Lady Sovereign? Grant? Absolutely not. I might venture and say most people right now don't remember Lady Sovereign, but I do, and Grant, you do, and that's enough. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, again, you can get an ad-free version of this program over at patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman, as well as access to the Discord and additional content at various tiers. Be back on Wednesday with something. Maybe we'll play some Super 56. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know what we'll do on Wednesday. We'll do something. I installed a game called True or Die, colon, Chirac. And it looks like something in the... It looks like something that belongs right next to uh, the day before, honestly. But it shipped. And it has 11 mostly positive reviews. So, I don't know. I don't know what the fuck is going on in this. It looks like a mess. Uh, I tried to launch it last night and it broke. So that's a good sign. If I can get it working, maybe we'll take a look at that. Or maybe not. I don't know. We'll be back. And then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be back on Friday to play some 8-bit Nintendo games and rank them. Got to get ranking. If you missed last week's show, it's on YouTube. Uh, Kid Icarus, Cobra Triangle, Schiller. A lot of big, big games getting ranked in that last episode of that show. Head on over to the, the YouTube channel, which how can you get to that? Is that, can you go to... What do I have that set to? If you go to guard.bike, you will end up on the YouTube channel. That's a fast way there. Or just search for my name and it'll turn up. You know, YouTube. It's where, the, it's where this show lives. Maybe you're watching this show on YouTube right now. I don't know. What's life like in the future? Do we, can, we, can we install Fortnite on our Android phones yet? We can. Well, that's just beautiful. Please like and subscribe. I'll see you soon.